uh, and this course is going to look at the use of some popular packages in Weka, specialist packages for specialist jobs in data mining. It follows on from two earlier courses, Data Mining with Weka and More Data Mining with Weka. And like those, we're going to pick up some basic principles along the way, as well as learning how to use uh, Weka. And also, we're going to look at some specific application areas in this course to give some example applications. As you know, a Weka is a bird found only in the islands of New Zealand. But as far as this course is concerned, it's a data mining workbench the Waikato Environment for Knowledge Analysis that contains a bunch of machine learning algorithms for various data mining tasks like classification, pre-processing, feature selection, clustering, association rule mining, things like that. In this course we're looking at version 3.7 and 3.8 of Weka 3.7 onwards, whereas the previous courses looked at Weka 3.6. Uh, this new version, these new versions have got a cleaner core plus a system where you can install packages that put in new functionality. So some of these packages, and there's a lot of them, some of them do things that were already in the core previously. They've been stripped out to make a cleaner Weka core. And there are lots and lots of other packages. Uh, we'll be looking at some of them and users can actually create and distribute their own packages if they want to put extra things in Weka. So what are you going to learn in this course? Well, we're going to learn how to use packages, which is very easy. We're going to look at the time series forecasting package and how to do time series forecasting with Weka. We're going to look at data stream mining, incremental classifiers in Weka, and we're looking at the MOA system for massive online analysis. There's a MOA package for Weka, which we'll install and look at. And then also the MOA system itself, You'll install that. It's got a very similar interface to Weka and look at some of its facilities for stream-oriented data mining. We're going to be looking at Weka's interface to the R data mining system. You can use facilities in R, which is a pretty advanced data mining system, from Weka. Getting all that extra functionality in your, uh, in your right inside your Weka. We're going to look at distributed processing using Apache, the Apache Spark system. We're going to be looking at scripting Weka in Python. There's a package which allows you to script Weka right from the Explorer. You can write little uh, Python scripts. And uh, also, you can install the uh, Python Weka wrapper where you install a full version of Python uh, with access to all of the things that Python gives you access to, plus Weka besides. And we're going to look at some applications. We're going to look at analyzing soil samples. We're going to look at neuroimaging with functional MRI data. We're going to look at classifying tweets and classifying images and signal peptide prediction. The aim of this course is to equip you to use Weka on your own data and most importantly to understand what it is that you're doing. We're assuming that you know about data mining and that you're a reasonably advanced user of Weka. You need to be a experienced Weka user to do this course. Uh, you could do the earlier courses, data mining with Weka and more data mining with Weka. Those would certainly prepare you adequately for this course, but you don't have to do those. Uh, just as long as you're an advanced user of Weka, and if you're not sure, you can look at some of the videos on the uh, YouTube Weka MOOC channel, the videos uh, from those earlier courses. So you need to be a Weka user. This is the team. These are the Weka people at Waikato, and uh, you'll uh, meet all of these people as we go through the classes and lessons in this course. They're all experienced Weka users. They've lived with Weka for many years. Okay, the course is organized just like the other courses. There are five classes. Each class corresponds to about a week. Uh, this class, the first class, is on time series forecasting, and then the other class is data stream mining, interfacing to R, distributed processing, and Python scripting. Within each class, there are six lessons. Each lesson is a brief YouTube video, five to ten minutes, like this one, followed by an activity. These activities, you actually get to use Weka to do things yourself. And this is where you do your real learning. You don't really learn from me talking to you. You learn from actually doing stuff yourself. The activities are very important in this course. The last lesson of each class is a particular application where we just show you how Weka has been used in a real application. In order to get a certificate, 
you need to do the mid-class assessment and the post-class assessment which are worth one-third and two-thirds of the credit. If you do sufficiently well in both of those then you'll get a signed certificate from uh, me uh, uh, certifying that you've completed the course. The activities are not required for assessment but we strongly recommend you to do them. As I said before this is where you're going to be doing your real learning. Now what you should do now is to down Weka 3.7 or 3.8 Actually, uh, I'm not sure 3.8 is out yet as I record this video. Uh, the way Weka works is that odd numbered distributions, that's 3.7, are development distributions, and then eventually they're released as stable distributions, as even numbered versions. So Weka 3.7 will be released as Weka 3.8 either before you see this or soon afterwards. Anyway, in any case, download the latest version of 3.7 or 3.8 if it exists. That'll be fine for this course. You download it for this, from this URL for Windows, Mac or Linux. You need to know how to do this and the uh, first course data mining with Weka will have taught you how to do that. That includes data sets for the course. You do have to use Weka 3.7 or 3.8. You can't use Weka 3.6 for this course because it doesn't have the package system. The new stuff in uh, this new version that we're looking at, in the core we have some additional filters and uh, some things have been stripped out. Some little used classifiers have been stripped out and moved into packages and also little used clusterers and association rule learners. Also in the core there are some additional feature selection methods. But the most important innovation in the new Weka systems is the, uh, is the package system. Uh, you go to the GUI chooser and on the tools menu you choose the packet manager. Let me do that and show you what happens. Uh, I'm in the uh, Weka chooser. Here's the package manager and it actually goes to the internet to get a list of packages. And here they are. So you can see all the other package for Arabic stemming here. There's a package for uh, clope algorithm, uh, package for evolution research. There's a lot of packages. Let me just scroll through these. There's just a lot of stuff here. I think there's 150, 154 packages at the moment. A lot of things. Let's go back to the slide. So 154 official packages. Uh, so this package list is on the internet. You need to be connected to the internet. When, uh, when I just did that with Weka and looked at the list of packages, it got them from the internet to get the most up-to-date version. As well as those official packages, there are unofficial packages, which are kind of user-supplied packages, and there's a list of those at this URL. So this is the first class. We've been looking at uh, Lesson 1.1, the introduction, and installing Weka. Next up is Time Series linear regression with lags. Then we're going to look at the time series forecasting package. And then lesson 1.4 we're going to look at forecasts and then we'll look at lag creation and overlay data. And then finally we'll look at an application analyzing infrared data from soil samples. So that's it for now. What you should do now is to go and do the activity associated with this lesson. It's a revision activity where you'll get to do uh, some of the more interesting questions from the final test, the end of class test for the previous MOOC. It'll just allow you to uh, exercise your, refresh your Weka facilities and remember how to do some of these things. So off you go and do that and I'll see you in the next lesson. But before I go, let me just tell you that, let me just show you that this is where I am at the moment. I'm sitting here in New Zealand. This is the world as we see it. New Zealand's at the top in the middle where the red arrow is and you're probably down at the bottom somewhere. Uh, the, this is where Weka is from. I've turned this map of New Zealand around so that North is at the top, which is probably more familiar to you. And we're right there, the home of Weka at the University of Waikato in the center of the North Island of New Zealand. I'm really looking forward to giving this course and looking forward to seeing you in the next lesson. Welcome back. Nice to see you again. In this lesson, we're going to start talking seriously about time series forecasting. We're going to look at linear regression with lags. We're not going to use a time series forecasting package yet. We'll start that in the next lesson. We're going to load a time series data set here in the Explorer. Going over to the Explorer, I'm going to load an airline. This is where my WECA data sets are. I don't know where yours are. 
Uh, I'm going to load airline.arf and uh, here it is. I'm going to just have a look at this data with the edit button and you can see that there's a passenger numbers attribute and then a date attribute that goes from uh, the 1st of January 1949 through to the 1st of December 1960. So these are this is ancient airline passenger data. And uh, we're going to go to classify here and we're going to predict with linear regression in the functions category. This is important. We're going to predict passenger numbers. It's the first attribute, so we need to set it here from the default uh, because Weka by default predicts the last attribute. I'm going to just click start and I get a. We're going to be looking at the root mean squared error here. It's 46.6 is what we get. We could look at the classifier errors. Now, this is a linear regression, so we're expecting a linear kind of line here. It's what linear regression predicts. I'm, on the y axis, I'm going to put the predicted passenger numbers, and on the x axis, I'm going to put the date, and there we have it. This is the predicted line. The size of these crosses incidentally indicates the size of the error at that point. But for our purposes here, it's a linear, it's a linear regression. Not really very interesting. One thing that's a little bit surprising is uh, the model is zero times date plus this constant, and that didn't look like that would be a horizontal line if it was really true. There's something a little bit funny about this, and what is funny about it is the date. If I go back and look here, the date attribute has got values ranging from these numbers here. So that's 662 billion minus 62 billion here, and that's because these dates are measured in milliseconds since January the 1st, 1970. So I'm going to convert them into months since the beginning of the data set. And I'm going to do that with a filter. And I'm, there's different ways of doing this, but I am going to use the add expression filter. And I'm going to make an expression that takes the second attribute, the date attribute, that's a2. And I'm going to divide that by, that's in milliseconds. I'm going to make it seconds. And then I'm going to make it minutes. Then I'm going to make it hours. Then I'm going to make it days. Then I'm going to make it years. 365 and a quarter days in a year. And uh, I'm going to add 21 to get from 1949 to 1970. And uh, I'm going to make this in months. It took me a little bit of a while to figure this out. I hope it's going to work. I'm going to call that attribute new date. And uh, let's see what happens here. I'm going to apply the filter. And now I've got new date, which goes from around about 0 to about 143. Now, there's a little issue here with leap years, right? I'm using this figure of 365.25 days in a year, which is um, pretty accurate on average, uh, but I should really take into account exactly which years are leap years and so on. So there's a bit of inexactness going on here. But never mind, just a bit approximate. I'm going to delete the date attribute, remove the date attribute. I'm going to look at the model again. I'm going to remember every time, this is a bit of a nuisance, every time I've got to remember to predict passenger numbers. And uh, if I run that, then uh, we're getting uh, this model 2.66 times the new date plus 90. It's the same model as before, but we've kind of scaled new dates. So now this coefficient, which used to be zero, rounded down to zero, is something more sensible. OK, so far so good. And so far, not very interesting. Uh, here is the regression line, and you can see the data. The data is kind of cyclic when you look at it. Passenger numbers, it depends on the month. you know. And yet the regression line is just a straight linear prediction. Not so interesting. Let's do something a little bit more interesting. We're going to copy the passenger numbers attribute. We're going to add a delayed version of passenger numbers. I'm going to use the copy filter to create a new attribute. I'm going to copy the first attribute and apply that. And here we've got copy of passenger numbers. I'm going to take this attribute and uh, uh, subtract 12, I'm going to kind of lag it, I'm going to delay it by 12 months. 
So it's going to contain the sort of last year's value for that month. I'm going to do that with a time series translate. And I'm going to configure that by, I'm going to translate the third attribute. I'm going to translate it by 12 months, subtract 12 months from that. And uh, I think that's okay. And then I need to actually, it doesn't, this particular filter doesn't work on the class. So I'm going to set the class back to passenger numbers. And then I'm going to run it and see what happens here. I go to edit. Now I can see this is my new attribute. And you can see that that 112 is this 112 here. In fact, this is a delayed version of this uh, attribute. This gives for this month, month number 13, this gives the figure for the year before. And these are unknown values. Terrific. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, I'm then uh, going to go back and predict this with linear regression. I need to remember to predict passenger numbers. So uh, there we go. And now I get a different model and a better root mean squared error, 31, 31.7. This is a kind of a model that uses uh, the, the date and then a little bit of the 12 months before copy. Now, actually, this is not a very good model. It's a little bit crazy. And the reason it's a little bit crazy is because of those missing values. We've got missing values at the beginning of the uh, data set. And we're going to get uh, much better results if we delete those instances with missing values. I'm going to do that with a filter. And I do that with an instance filter called remove range. And I'm going to remove instances from 1 to 12. And if I apply that, and now if I look at my data, I don't have missing values. This starts out with the 112 data, which is 12 months before. And this starts out on the 13th month of the original data, which is what I want. So I'm then going to go now and Classify that with linear regression. Don't forget to predict passenger numbers. There we go. And now I get a much smaller root mean square error of 16. And I'm getting quite a sensible model. This says passenger numbers increase a little bit. Take the passenger numbers of the year before, add 7%, and then just a little offset here. I could try and visualize this model. Uh, I'll just show you. If I do it this way, it's not really very informative because... Hello again, and welcome back to Advanced Data Mining with Weka. This is Lesson 1.3. We're going to look at the time series forecasting package now to do roughly what we did uh, last in the last lesson without the time series forecasting package. So we need to install it first of all. So let me go to my Weka tools menu, the package manager. Here's the package manager. And uh, here are the packages. And if I kind of scroll down, it's kind of pretty hard to find things in this list of packages. But um, near the end is the time series forecasting package. And uh, if I click install here, that will install it. Actually, it's already installed on my computer, so I'm not going to do that. I've got the airline data loaded here. The time series package has given me this additional forecast tab. I'm going to go straight to that. And without any more ado, I'm just going to click Start and see what happens. Well, the time series package transforms the data into a large number of attributes. Unfortunately, you don't get to see the attributes in the pre-process panel. We still just have those two attributes there. You don't see the generated attributes there. You have to go to the forecast panel and look here. Here's the original attributes, and here's the transformed training data passenger numbers. We've got month, quarter, date, date remapped. The date remapped is like what we did for the date in the last lesson. We did it manually. We changed it from milliseconds since January the 1st, 1970. You do something more sensible. Uh, this actually does a better job because it takes proper account of which years are leap years and which years aren't leap years. Then we've got these lagged variables, the passenger numbers lagged by. We just had 12 before, but we've now we've got the lags by 1, 2, 3, right up to 12 for 12 months, I guess. 
we got the square of the date remapped and the cube of the date remapped in case you need those and a bunch of other things the date remapped times these lagged variables that's a lot of variables and underneath here is the generated model which is very complicated let's see how well it does actually it doesn't show here how well it does to see that we have to turn on perform evaluation let me click that here run it again and we get a root mean square error of 10.6 on the um, training set uh, which looks good uh, last time we got 16.0 that was the best figure we got but remember this is the error on the training set that's always very misleading let's make a simpler model there's a lot of attributes here I'm going to uh, we can't edit the generated attributes like I said but we can apply a filter so I'm going to go to advanced configuration and for my base learner I'm going to choose the filtered classifier and in the filtered classifier I'm going to specify linear regression just like we had before and for the filter I'm going to choose uh, remove the remove attribute filter here it is and I'm going to configure that to remove attributes number 1, 4 and 16 which I happen to know are the correct ones I'm sorry I'm going to leave attributes 1, 4 and 16 I'm going to set invert selection to true so these are the three attributes I leave well let's just see what happens go back and look at my attributes and here's the generated attributes that we saw before now here's the filtered attributes we've got passenger numbers We've got date remapped and we've got this lag by 12. This is what we did in the last lesson, remember? And uh, let's see how we get on here. We got a root mean squared error of 27.8. Actually, we got that in the last lesson, but uh, we got even better results by deleting the first 12 instances. Remember, the first 12 instances uh, have got lagged values with unknown values and linear regression does bad things with unknown values at least as far as time series are concerned so I want to delete the first uh, the first 12 instances now I could do that by I want to apply two filters removing attributes and removing instances and I could use the multi filter but actually on the time series forecasting panel there's an easy way of doing that which you really need to learn because you're going to be doing it a lot uh, in advanced configuration we're going to look at the lag creation and the more options and we're going to say removing remove leading instances with unknown lag values and let me run that and now I get a root mean square of 15.8 and a model which is exactly the same as the model we got in the last uh, lesson 1.07 times lag passenger numbers plus 12.7 that's what we got before Now let's just return to this full model that we had. Let's go back to the, we won't use the filtered classifier, we'll use the, uh, just use linear regression. Here it is. And now we get uh, a root mean square of 8.7. Looks fantastic. But the model looks extremely complicated. We looked at it before, here it is again. Look at the complexity of this model so it's probably overfitted what we'd like to do is to evaluate this on held out training data and we can do that with the evaluation panel we're going to evaluate on on uh, i'm going to evaluate on we can either have a fraction here or a number of instances i'm going to evaluate on 24 instances that is two years worth of instances and uh, run that and i guess an error on the test data of 59 that's huge the error on the training data is only 6.4 so let's just have a look at this on the slide with a full model all the attributes we got this enormous gap between the training error and the test error and with a simple model with just two attributes there there's a little gap but not very big so we could try reducing the attributes in, an, in other ways. We could actually use the attribute selected classifier. I won't do that for you, but to do that, I'd have to choose the uh, meta learner attribute selected classifier and specify linear regression as the base learner and then specify some attribute selection method. 
uh, and if I left that at its defaults, all the defaults, I would in fact get four attributes selected. And I'd get a training and test error of 11 and 19, still some indication of overfitting. The gap between these two figures really indicates overfitting. Now we reduce the lag, we, we reduce the model to two attributes using the uh, using a filter, uh, the remove filter. But actually, there's a simpler way of doing that, which you need to learn in the forecast panel. If you go to the lag creation, it's going to create lags between one and twelve. We saw those. If you use custom lag lengths, we can increase that to twelve. And now it's only going to create the lag length of 12. I can remove the powers of time. Remember we have the time squared and the time cubed. And we can remove the product of time and lag variables. And if I go to periodic attributes here and click customize, then I can include whichever ones of these attributes uh, it wants to generate. Now I'm not going to include any of those. So that will get us the simplest kind of attribute set. I'll just run that. Hello, and welcome back to New Zealand for another few minutes of advanced data mining with Weka. Uh, in lesson 1.4, we're going to continue our exploration of the time series forecasting package. In the last lesson, I showed you some graphs which I actually made with Excel for the purposes of presentation. But the time series forecasting package can make such graphs itself. And we're going to show you how to look at the output of the, of the package. So I think you should restart the Explorer just to get the reinitialize uh, all of the uh, options in the time series forecasting stuff. And uh, load the airline.arf. Uh, I've done that. Uh, I'm going to uh, go to forecast and click start here. Uh, and uh, we get this output, which we haven't looked at before, train future predictions, it's called. And you can see this is a graph, actually, of passenger numbers. And if you look very carefully, you can see that uh, these are square uh, data points. And the very last one is a round data point. That's a predicted passenger number. We're only predicting one time unit here. But we can change that. Let's go up to the interface and change the number of time units to forecast to, say, 12. And try again. And now you can see that we've got these kind of 12 predicted points and a dashed line. So we're for forecasting ahead from the end of the, the uh, data, the training data. Uh, let's go to uh, the lag creation panel. And remember, we removed the leading instances with unknown lag values. That'll remove the first 12 uh, instances. And we can do that again. Actually, it doesn't affect the graph. We still get the same graph, but we know that the first 12 instances are not being used to create the model. Coming back to the slide, if you think about the timeline like this, here's the kind of data set, uh, that kind of top line. And then underneath, we've got the dashed line with the leading instances, 12 of them. Uh, and then the uh, training data for future predictions, and then the future predictions uh, leading ahead after the end of the data set. All right, now let's do some evaluation here. We're going to evaluate on the training data and on 24 held out instances. So I'm going to go to the evaluation panel and evaluate on the training data and 24 held out instances, two years worth, and run that. And now I get the uh, train future predictions output here, which uh, ends at the end of the training data and then shows us the uh, future 12 future predictions from that point. So coming back to the slide, we've got the data set. We've got the training data now, uh, which is uh, all of the data set except for the last 24 instances. And the future predictions from the training data is the dashed kind of line there. And then if we look at the other output here, going back to Weka, test future predictions. You can see now we've got the test data here and future predictions from the end of the test data, these kind of dashed, this dashed line with the round points. So coming back on the slide, we've got the whole data set. Uh, and then we've got the training data. And then we've got the test data and future predictions from the end of the test data, that is, after the end of the data set.
Uh, now, it would be nice to see the uh, one step uh, ahead estimates for the test data. There's a lot of graphing options here. First of all, I'm going to turn off the evaluation on training because that's just going to kind of give us too much data to look at. Uh, let's just look at evaluating on the, uh, on the test data. I'm not going to graph the future predictions at all. And now if I run this, I get no graphical output. There's nothing, right? So let's turn on graph the predictions at step one and run it. And now you can see here the test predictions for the target. You can see in blue the predicted passenger numbers and in red the actual passenger numbers. So we can see there the discrepancy on the uh, test data between the one step ahead predictions and the actual data itself. We're going to then do a little bit more on this panel. We're going to graph the predictions at step 12. That is 12 step ahead predictions. And then we're going to compare one step ahead, six steps ahead, and 12 step ahead predictions. So let's go back here. I'm going to graph the target. Uh, no, I'm going to graph predictions at step 12. And now I, of course, get worse predictions because we're predicting 12 steps ahead. You'd expect that to get worse. And there's a consistent error where they kind of undershoot the actual data values because, of course, with multi-step ahead predictions, with any step ahead predictions, once you make an error on the first prediction, then that error kind of continues to propagate uh, through the future predictions. Let's graph the target. We've only got one possible target here. If we had other attributes, we could graph them, but we're just going to graph passenger numbers at step 12. And actually, that's going to give the same result. So I've got two graphs here, the one we had before, and the new one, which looks exactly the same. Uh, however, you can do better things here. I'm going to turn the old one off just to stop too much confusion. And I'm going to graph, we can put in a comma-separated list of numbers here. So I'm going to graph one step ahead, six steps ahead, and 12 steps ahead predictions. And now you can see them in different colors. The uh, difference between one step ahead predictions, the most accurate, that's the blue line, six steps ahead predictions, which is the green line, and uh, yellow, which is considerably worse, and 12 step ahead predictions, which is a bit worse still, the yellow line. You can compare predictions different points ahead. Now I'm just going to improve these predictions. Uh, uh, just to finish off, I'm going to go to my base learner and change it from linear regression to SMO, uh, which uh, we found in one of the activities was uh, tended to be better than linear regression. And let's have a look at that. You can see those predictions are uh, quite a bit better than they were with linear regression. And let's go and change. We, we're using this large model with a large number of attributes here. Uh, I'm going to uh, reduce the number of attributes. I'm going to just use a lag of 12. And then I'm going not to include powers of time. I'm not going to include products of time and lag variables. I'm going here and I'm going to customize this by not including any of these periodic attributes. If I run this again, well, I've got a much simpler model here. This is the model based on just the date and the lag by 12. And now if I look at those graphs that I saw before, well, you can't see them. You can't see them because they're all on top of each other. It's predicting the red and it's plotting the red and the blue last and the uh, green and the yellow are kind of hidden uh, underneath the one step ahead predictions. So I've showed you several different options for visualizing time series predictions. And uh, we talked about the need to distinguish different parts of the timeline, the initialization part with the leading instances, uh, which contain unknown values for the lagged variables. Uh, extrapolation past the end of the data set into future predictions. The full training data. The test data, if evaluation is specified. And the training data with the test data held out. And uh, we extrapolate past the end of that for so-called future predictions based on the training data. And we showed how you can look at different numbers of steps 
ahead when making predictions. You can uh, read more about this in uh, a, a document about the time series analysis and forecasting package with Weka, uh, referenced there at the bottom. And then now it's time for you to go and have a look at the activity associated with this lesson, which will sort of take you through some of the different output options, but looking at the textual output rather than the, gra rather than the graphical output. So good luck with that, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back to New Zealand for some more advanced data mining with Weka. This is the last lesson on the time series forecasting facilities. We're going to look at some features that we haven't uh, looked at so far. First of all, the timestamp uh, that any attribute of type date is used by default as a timestamp, but you can change this under the basic configuration parameters. I've uh, loaded the airline data once again, and if I go to the forecast panel, it's going to use date as a timestamp, but I could change that to another attribute if I wanted. Also, the periodicity. We've been detecting the periodicity automatically. This data is monthly. I think it's 143 monthly instances, but we can specify something else if we prefer. So we could actually specify, let's say, weekly. This is not necessarily a very sensible thing to do, but what would happen if we specified weekly? First of all, it affects the lagged variables, the variables that are generated. So now we've got uh, a large number of lagged variables. Actually, with weekly data, we've got 52 lagged variables generated 52 weeks in a year, a whole year's worth. Uh, and as well as that, it inserts new Weka inserts interpolated instances for the missing values. So if we specify we try and do this weekly and the data was only monthly, then there's a whole lot of weeks which need to be interpolated. And these are them, these weeks. And there's a long list of weeks here which have been interpolated into the data. And then, of course, in order to get values for the uh, training instances, they're all missing values. So the, uh, the Weka interpolates uh, the values for all of the attributes, so these have been these values have been interpolated. So in this case, the airline data monthly is 144 instances. Uh, weekly is we've got 573 instances here, and if I were to specify hourly, we'd have 104,000 instances. And the periodicity, as I said, determines what attributes are created. Different uh, numbers of lagged variables depending on whether it's monthly, weekly, daily, or hourly. And uh, if it's daily, then we include a day of the week attribute, uh, weekend attributes. If it's hourly, we include a morning or afternoon attribute. And of course, you can override all of these attributes using the advanced configuration panel. I bet you're tired of the airline data now. I'm going to open another data set, the Apple Stocks data. We need to find this data. Uh, when you install a package in Weka, it installs the package information in your home folder. So I'm going to go to my home folder, Weka files, packages, time series forecasting package. And here I've got some sample data, time series forecasting data. I'm going to open Apple Stocks. Now, this data contains more than one thing to predict. It's actually got the daily high, low, opening and closing values for the Apple stocks in the year 2011, plus the sales volume. So I'm going to go here and tell the forecast. I need to tell it what to forecast. I'm going to forecast close. And uh, let me just see what happens. It's generated lags here. Uh, it's generated 12 lags. I think I want to tell it this data is weekly, actually. Um, I don't think it's uh, figured that out. So let's, the periodicity is weekly. No, I'm sorry. The periodicity is daily for this data. Let me uh, do that. And now I've got, I've got seven lagged variables for the seven, so a whole week's worth of lagged variables. And uh, there were some missing values. Some instances were inserted, a few instances. Those are mostly weekends, actually, those instances. Uh, and that's what the skip list is for. I don't really want to include weekends because the stock market is closed. If I type weekend here, 
Then do this again. Then I will have reduced the number of interpolated instances. There are still a few of them, five of them, and those correspond to holidays when the stock exchange was closed. So I can actually specify a list of dates here as well as the word weekend. I specified a list of dates in a format that's on the slide. Uh, let me just try that. Now I'm hoping for no interpolated instances. Yeah, there's none there. And I think what I'd like to do is to specify under the lags, I want to use maybe two weeks worth. That'll be 10 working days. So let's up that number to 10. Okay, that's the data prepared. Now let's do some evaluation on this data. First of all, I'm going to remove the leading instances, which we find to be the ones with unknown lag values, which is a good idea. And then we're going to hold out some of the instances. So let's go and remove leading instances. And then go to evaluation. We're going to evaluate on training and test. And I'm going to leave this at 30%. We're going to use 30% of the data set for testing. OK, and I'm going to look here at the mean absolute error. So uh, we've got uh, these numbers here, 7.7 .7 on the slide. You can see that uh, when we remove, since we've removed the leading instances, we've got slightly better results than if we hadn't have done that. We can predict more than one target with this data. And we're, if we do that, we're going to get lagged versions of each of the targets, and that might help. So let's go and predict close and high. So we're going to get lagged values of both of these variables. And it's possible we might get better predictions. Well, actually, we don't. These are the values we get, uh, 8 on the test data and 3.4 on the training data, slightly worse than before. And if we were to select all of the variables as targets, we'd get even worse results. We get quite bad over fitting here with a much smaller training error, 2.5, than the test error, 9.6. Now, another thing that you need to know about is overlay data. Overlay data is additional data that might be relevant to the prediction. It's not to be forecast. It can't be predicted. And it's available in the future. Overlay data is available in the future. We don't have overlay data for the Apple stocks problem, but I'm going to kind of cheat by using uh, one of the existing attributes as though it were overlay data, as though we knew it even in the future. So let me just predict close and then I'm going to go and specify some overlay data. We're going to use open as overlay data and uh, I can then uh, see what happens and I got a complaint here from Weka. It's unable to generate a future forecast because there's no future values available for the overlay data. Well, let's just stop it trying to generate future forecasts. Uh, if I just take out these output future predictions and do it again, then yeah, I won't get that error message. And back on the slide, we can see that the uh, overlay data has improved things quite a bit by including open. The test uh, error has got down to 5.9. And if we include high as well, it gets down even further. And although I won't do this for you, if I were to change the base learner to SMO, a better learner, I would get even better results down to a very small error on the test data 2.4. Uh, and in fact, I would get these graphs if I looked at predictions. Again, to save time, I won't do that. But you can see the prediction on the training data, the prediction on the test data. We're getting very good predictions using this overlay data. Well, we've covered uh, quite a few options in the time series forecasting package. When you're starting with a new data set, uh, you should start by getting the time axis right. Uh, don't forget that uh, missing instances are automatically interpolated, and uh, you can uh, select the periodicity yourself if you like. And there's a skip facility to ensure that time increases linearly. Then you need to select your target, what you're going to predict, or targets. Uh, overlay data can help a lot, obviously, if you can get a hold of it. That's always wonderful. We haven't looked at quite a few features of this package. We haven't looked at confidence intervals, 
adjusting for variance and a bunch of other things. Um, you can read about that in the documentation for the package and uh, here's a reference to uh, the whole approach, this regression approach to time series analysis which was followed when building Weka's time series forecasting package. So off you go, do the activity and we'll see you in the next lesson where we're going to talk about an application of Weka. And today's lesson 1.6 is infrared data from soil samples. Before starting to talk about the actual application we'll develop and look at in the activity 1.6, I thought I'd just mention something about application development in general. So the top academic conference in machine learning is called ICML, International Conference on Machine Learning. This is where all the top people in the field present their work. In 2012, a paper was published at this conference which was something of a wake-up call to the machine learning community. The author was Kiri Wagstaff from the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California, and the paper, which is accessible to anyone with an interest in machine learning, is called Machine Learning That Matters. And the URL there on the slide will enable you to download it and read it. So what the paper does is it kind of points out that the field is focusing too much on new methods and on the accuracy of those methods and less on the kind of application that will really make a difference. So what Kiri did was to suggest six challenges for machine learning applications. I'm not going to go through all the six that are listed there on the slide. But I just want to talk about the highlighted one, $100 million saved through improved decision making provided by an ML system. Now, believe it or not, you can develop an ML system using near-infrared data on soil samples that will be something that could save a hundred million dollars. So this lesson's a starting point for such a system, but it is possible. Now, before we do that, let's just take a moment to think about what machine learning requires in order for us to develop an application of any kind. Well, it needs input and output in its training phase. So, in our case, we need a set of samples. Those are going to be soil samples in some form, and you'll see that in, in a while, and an output target value. In our case, this is going to be a real valued number, and will represent a property of interest of the soil. So that could be organic carbon, organic nitrogen, available nitrogen, potassium, something that we're interested in predicting from the input. And our problem, of course, is to learn a mapping that describes the relationship between the input and the output. And we refer to this mapping as a model. We build the model on our training data, and then we use that model on unseen observations, so new soil, if you like, in order to, we apply the model to the new soil in order to, for it to predict the target or soil property of that soil that we're interested in, such as the organic carbon. Okay, so now we need to think about where we're going to get X and Y from for this particular application. Now, traditionally, soil samples are processed using techniques called wet chemistry techniques. And what those chemis wet chemistry techniques are trying to do is to determine the properties of the soil, such as available nitrogen, organic carbon and so forth. So they will result in the Y values that we're interested in. So what we need for this application is for a number of samples to have been processed using wet chemistry to determine these Y values for us. So let's say we're interested in available nitrogen, we need let's say 50 or 100 different soil samples to have been processed using wet chemistry to produce 50 to 100 Y values. Now we need to take a portion of each of those samples from let's say a thing called a soil bank. So let's just suppose we've got a soil bank. We divide our soil sample into half. We send half off to the wet chemistry lab to get the property determined. And with the other half, we put that through a near-infrared device and that will produce the X values for our input. Now the near-infrared device produces a signature, if you like, for the soil sample. 
and I've got an example of one there below on the slide. So these values will form the input. In the sense of an R file, they represent the values or reflectance values for a given wavelength band. So you'll see in the R file produced for the activity that that starts at around 350 nanometers, that's the first attribute. The next one might be 370 nanometers, 390 or 80, 90, 400, 410 and so on. So the number of attributes we have is, as you'll see in the example, is something like 200 um, for each of those spectral uh, wavelength bands and then the values are um, numeric values which which are the amplitudes if you like of the spectrum uh, but just the reflectance values that you get from the device. So as I said you need a few hundred samples so it's not cheap because you've got to send off whatever you number of samples you've got it's very cheap to get the X but it's expensive to get the Y because you've got to send those off for wet chemistry analysis. So to put together a decent training set is expensive. So given that why would you bother doing that for this particular for, for the soil and this particular application. Well, once you've let's say you've got your 50 to 100 samples and you've built your model, then if a farmer comes in with a new soil sample and says I want to know what the available nitrogen is, we just get out our available nitrogen model that we've built and we get the NIR spectra for that new sample and then so that represents new X, if you like. We run it through the model, and it will produce an estimate of Y for that soil signature. So we'll be able to tell the farmer, for your soil sample, the available nitrogen is 4.3, or whatever the, that, y, that estimate, estimated Y value is. So instead of days for the wet chemistry to take place, we're talking about milliseconds for the NIR device to produce the signature for us to run through the model and get the estimate of Y. So that's the first thing that makes it useful. It's very fast. Second thing that makes it useful is that we can produce for the same input if we've got enough models an estimate for a number of soil properties, not just one. So if we've got, for example, wet chemistry which has determined the potassium, the available nitrogen, the organic carbon, the organic nitrogen and so on, then we can build models for each of those and for the same X value we can produce predictions for each of those soil properties. So we can tell the farmer with the soil sample in very short order, of the order of milliseconds, what the values are for each of those soil properties. Alright, so that's the value of it. How do we actually go about doing the modelling? For the training set, remember, let's imagine it's an R file, the rightmost column or the, the class column would be a numeric set of numeric values, so we're talking about a regression problem, and then the attributes are all these reflectance values at various wavelengths, so they're all numeric values as well. So we've got X numeric values and so is Y. The classifiers of interest are things such as linear regression, rep tree, the model tree, M5 prime, random forest, support vector machine regression, Gaussian processes, and so on. So what I've done there is lined up the algorithms in terms of really their processing speed. What you'll do in the activity is you'll process the data using the first four because you'll see that it's quite a large data set and the other two uh, take too long really to be useful in the activity. But we'll be saying more about that later. The big thing message though of the activity is that pre-processing can make a big difference to a classifier's performance. So what the activity will basically take you through is establishing a benchmark just using the classifiers on a on raw data and then using various pre-processing techniques and seeing whether or not the classifiers improve on the data sets produced after pre-processing. So in, typically for near-infrared data, the kinds of things you can do to pre-process it are to downsample the data, to remove baseline effects, and to smooth the spectrum. And you'll be doing all three of those and combinations of those three in the activity. 
So the reason I mentioned the slower classifiers, such as support vector machines and Gaussian processors, is that the activity involves processing 4,000 soil samples. Oh, roughly 4,000 anyway. Uh, and what you'll be doing is looking to see if you can develop a model for organic carbon. That will be the Y value. But as I said previously, organic nitrogen is also in the data set. So if you want to run the activity completely again using organic nitrogen instead of organic carbon, then you're welcome to. So what you'll do is you'll process the data raw and then you'll see what happens to the results when you start applying the pre-processing techniques. And the classifiers respond in different ways to the different pre-processing techniques. Some get better, some get worse, some stay the same. But you'll see all those effects through the activity. One thing that's worth bearing in mind is that you're about to enter experimental machine learning where you're going to have a lots of results because the activity takes you through the first four classifiers on the previous slide but all in default mode. Now each of them has parameters that can be tweaked and so can each form the basis for a separate experiment and you'll be using four pre-processing methods one of which is to do nothing just use the raw spectra now some of those methods themselves have parameters as well. And of course you can combine the pre-processing methods as well. So the space of experiments is extremely large. And from all of that, you'll be able to produce some pretty good results. Now what you'll be looking at is particularly the correlation coefficient. So how well does the predicted value match the um, known value from the training data using cross-validation. So that will give you some idea of how close you are. And what you want, of course, is to produce models that get you close to 1.0, a perfect correlation with what you've seen in training data previously. Now, you'll see that that's not possible because there's too much error in the data, typically. But it will be a starting point. But you'll mainly see the improvement you can get from that base baseline or benchmarking that you do with the raw data to what happens when you apply various pre-processing techniques. So I hope you enjoy that and I hope it whets your appetite for machine learning application development. To class 2 of Advanced Data Mining with Weka. My name is Albert Biffet. I'm a member of the Weka Machine Learning Group and I work at Telecom Paris Tech in Paris, France. So in this class we are going to talk about uh, data stream mining in Weka MOA. Uh, Data stream mining is a way of doing uh, real-time analytics, so this is going to be very, very important for big data and uh, Internet of Things. So let's start with the first lesson that is going to be incremental classifiers in Weka. So as you know, in Weka usually what we do is that we store all the data set in memory, and then what we do is that we build our classifier using this data set that is stored in memory. This is what is called the byte setting. In the incremental setting, what we do is that we update the, our classifier one instance by one instance. So uh, there is a huge difference between the two settings. Let's look at the incremental setting with more detail. So the idea is that what we do is that we process uh, an example uh, every time. So only one example, no a data set of examples. We use a limited amount of memory because we don't store all the data set in memory. We work in a limited amount of time, so we need to be very, very fast, and we are ready to predict at any point. So that's the main difference. So in the byte setting, what we do is that we process all the data set, and then we are ready to predict at the end of the building the classifier. Uh, Weka has many different incremental methods. To know which ones are incremental, we need to look that they should implement the updatable classifier interface. So we can find many different methods, as naive base, naive base multinomial, so nearest neighbors, stochastic gradient descent, and also some decision trees as the Hofding tree. As you know, the standard decision tree is not incremental, so it needs to have all the data set in memory. So the Hofding tree is the first, uh, is the state of the art in uh, incremental decision tree learning. So the Hofding tree was proposed by Pedro Domingos and his group around 2000. And 
the difference with the standard decision tree is that in the standard decision tree what we do is that when we need to decide if we want to split or not what we do is that we look at the data that we have in memory and then we compute the statistics and then we decide if we split or not but in the incremental setting we don't store data set in memory so then what we need to do if we want to decide if we want to split or not we need to wait two new instances to arrive so how many instances do we need to decide if we want to split or not so this is something that is computed using the host inbound and this is why the host tree has uh, this name another interesting thing of the host tree is that it has theoretical guarantees that if we if the number of instances that we are using to build the model is large enough the decision tree is going to be similar to the standard to a decision tree built using the standard decision tree uh, method. Let's see an example in Weka. So we are going to generate a data set and then we are going to evaluate using a housing tree. Let's start generating the data. So we are going to use the random radio base function generator. So this is a generator that generates data by creating for each class a random set of centers. In that case, we're going to use 50 centroids, 10 attributes, two classes. We're going to create 1,000 instances. Let's generate the data. Okay, so now we have the data, 1,000 instances. Now let's classify it using the housing tree. So let's choose the classifier, housing tree. We're going to run a tenfold cross-validation. We see this is very fast and we get an accuracy of 71%. Now, let's do it again, but generating 100,000 instances. So we change this parameter. We generate the data. Then we can again, we run again the tenfold cross validation. We see that it takes more time, but still it's really fast. And at the end, what we get is the accuracy goes to 89 percent so with 100,000 instances we get 89 percent and with 1,000 instances we were getting only 71 percent so increasing the number of instances that the housing tree uh, processes that uh, allows us to to have a much better accuracy so in this lesson we have seen the two settings of Weka, the byte setting and the incremental setting. So in the byte setting what we did is that we store all the data set in memory and in the incremental setting what we do is that we build the classifier uh, one instance by one instance. And the nice thing of the incremental setting is that we can be much more efficient and then we use less memory and we are much faster. See you in the next class. Back to class 2 data stream mining in Weka and MOA. In this lesson, we are going to look at Weka MOA's package. So let's start. What is MOA? So MOA is an open source software that is a specific design for mining data streams. The most important thing of MOA is that it can handle evolving data streams. Data streams that are changing, data streams with concept drift. MOA has many methods from classification, regression, clustering, frequent pattern mining, outlier detection, concept drift, and it's very easy to use and very easy to extend. MOA can be used alone or can be used with Weka or can be used with Adams and with Mecha. So Adams is a very nice workflow engine where you can develop your workflows and Mecha is a software specific for multi-label learning. MOA runs in a single computer. In the case that you need to do data stream mining in a cluster of computers, like the ones that are used in the Hadoop ecosystem, then Apache Samoa could be the right tool for you. So Samoa allows you to run uh, stream mining jobs on Apache Storm, Apache S4, Apache Samsa, and nowadays uh, Apache Flink. As you know, New Zealand is very famous for birds. So Weka is a native bird of New Zealand. Moa is also a native bird of New Zealand. Uh, it's also flightless as the Weka, but nowadays is extinct. As you can see in these pictures, the MOA was a very large bird. If you compare here with the size of a Weka or a Kiwi, we see that the MOA was really large. Or here comparing with the size of a human person. Let's see how to install the MOA package in Weka. So we're going to go to Tools. We're going to open the Package Manager. 
and from there we are going to look for the massive online package let's look for it should go to the M massive online analysis then we install it we say yes okay and once when it is installed we go to the explorer and then we can see the object of MOA inside Weka. so there are two types one is the data generators and the other are the classifiers so for example if we want to generate data now we can look at the MOA generator and from the MOA generator we can access to all the data stream generators inside MOA okay so let's choose one for example and let's generate some data the other important thing is that we can have access to all the MOA classifiers so we go inside uh, classifiers inside meta we'll find this MOA classifier and from this MOA classifier we can get access to all the classifiers in MOA so here are all the classifiers in MOA so let's choose for example a meta classifier we can choose the online bugging let's call OSA bug okay and that's all so in this lesson we have seen how to install the MOA package in Weka we have seen that MOA is a open source software specific design for data stream mining it handles evolving data streams and it has many many different methods for clustering classification regression frequent pattern mining and layer detection concept risk and it's very easy to use and very easy to extend hello welcome back to data stream mining in weka and moa in today's lesson we're going to look at the moa interface so moa can be used in three different ways using the graphical user interface the command line or the Java API. Let's start with uh, classification evaluation. So in the byte setting, we have two different types of evaluation. Uh, hold out, when we have different data for testing and training, or tenfold cross-validation when we are using the same data for testing and training. In the incremental setting, what we have is that we have two types, hold out evaluation and also frequential evaluation. So let's look at these two types of evaluation. So in the holdout evaluation, what we are doing is that we are training our model, one instance by one instance, and then periodically we are doing an evaluation uh, testing using different uh, instances. In the frequential evaluation, what we are doing is that we are using the same data for testing and training. In that sense, what we are doing is that we are uh, testing and training every one of the instances of the of the stream so every time a new instance arrives first we test and then we train let's look at the MOA interface so first we are going to download the software so let's go to the MOA web page from the MOA web page what we are going to go is to downloads and from there we are going to download the last release okay once we have the once uh, MOA is uh, download we can run it uh, from the bin folder if it's in Windows using MOA.bat and if not to using MOA.sh so let's run it so what we see is that we have several tabs one is for classification the other is for regression also for clustering liars and concept rift so let's start with classification let's run a task we're going to run a evaluation task let's start uh, with uh, with the holdout evaluation with evaluate periodic held out test so we need to specify what's the learner in that case going to be the housing tree what's the stream in this case we're going to select the hyperplane generator okay and then how many instances we want to use for testing in that case we say that we want to use 1000 instances and we want to train 1 million of instances
and we want to see the results every 10,000 instances. Okay, so that's the definition of the task. We see that it's here specified, evaluate periodic held out, and then we run it. So we see that here the, we have all the uh, results, and here we see that there is a, a plot of these results, where we have also the different measures, accuracy, kappa. Okay, so now let's run a frequential evaluation. So again, we change the task. We are going to change to evaluate frequency. We're going to define again what's the learner. In that case, it's going to be the housing tree. Okay, then the stream, we're going to select the hyperplane generator. Okay, and then we're going to train 1 million instances and we're going to look at the results every 10,000 instances. Okay, so now we run the task. So here we see the results and here we see the, the evolution of these measures. And now the nice thing is that we can compare both. So if we look at this, we see that one appears in red and the other appears in, in blue. So we can take a look at that and we can also zoom it to look at in more detail. Another way to use MOA is using the command line. So we can reuse the command line that we have in the graphical user interface. So when we were selecting what was the task that we want to run, we can use this the same uh, text and we can put it inside the command line. And what we are doing then is that we are uh, executing the task using this MOA dot uh, do task. Then we need only to specify what is the task, what is the learner that we want to use, what is the stream that we want to use, how many instances we want to use. In this lesson, we have seen how to use the MOA interface. So we know that there are three different ways. We have the graphical user interface, the command line, and the Java API. And also we have seen the two types of evaluation for incremental learning. That is the holdout evaluation and the frequential evaluation. Hello, my name is Bernhard Feinger. I'm with the Computer Science Department here at the University of Waikato, the home of Weka and MOA. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about MOA. Specifically, we're going to talk about change. Change is everywhere in data streams. This is the distinguishing feature of data stream mining. If you think about, like, you want to predict electricity consumption, there's a big peak in the morning and there's another peak in the late evening. There's a, some level of consumption during the day, and there might be a much lower level of consumption during nighttime. There's different levels in summer to winter, and so on and so forth. If you look at tweet streams, for instance, right now uh, the Zika virus is trending. A couple of months ago, at least in New Zealand, it was Rugby World Cup. Again, we see change happening all the time. New topics are coming in, becoming more interested, speak, and then they slowly die away, making place for new other topics. So how do we deal with change? Some algorithms can just basically, because of the way they work, implicitly adapt to change, but a better way is to do it ex explicitly. So we need a change detector. A couple of algorithms that have been described in the literature for that purpose, one of them is Edwin which is short for adaptive windowing. It's used in a number of algorithms inside MOA. It keeps an adaptive sliding window, which tries to estimate the mean of a numeric variable that you're monitoring. Whenever things are stable, the window grows. But once there seems to be some change, we cut the window into two parts, the old part and the new part old part is being discarded, the new part hopefully gives us the new correct mean. Now this is not just a heuristic algorithm, it comes with guarantees, theoretical guarantees on the rates of false positives and the rates of false negatives and on the size related to the rate of change. 
I don't have to worry about the size and it being too big because the way it's stored internally it uses an exponential compression scheme so that's fine as well. Now Edwin is being used in a number of algorithms as I said one of them is the Höfting adaptive tree which as the name implies is a variant of the Höfting tree that Albert has explained to you previously. Now in the Höfting adaptive tree you do not just grow the tree on the most promising tests you also look at like the second best ones and so you grow alternative branches as well and you monitor the performance of those alternatives over time using Edwin. And whenever Edwin detects that these alternatives actually now have become better or are outperforming the official main structure, you replace the main with the alternative. And of course at the same time you start growing new alternatives as well to be prepared for further change in the future. Okay, so the Hefting Adaptive Tree was a single classifier. Now of course we all know that when it comes to utmost predictive accuracy, you want to have ensembles. A very simple ensemble method is bagging. Now, bagging is easily made into an online algorithm because, just think about it, if you bag, say, an incremental algorithm like the Höfting tree, you have an incremental ensemble immediately. No problem there. Of course, there's a little issue and that is the way bagging distributes examples across the different classifiers. So in the batch learning version you do bootstrap sampling with replacement. So classifier 1 in our simple example here which has a data set that comprises only four examples A, B, C and D might see a sample that is B, A, C, B and classifier 2 might get D, B, A, D classifier 4 very extreme one might actually get three copies of B and only one C and never sees A or D. So how do we solve this issue with getting a procedure that's basically batch oriented like bootstrap sampling and turn it into something incremental? Well, there's two simple steps to look at here. First of all, we can actually look at our subsamples by sorting them thus we restore the original order of the data. So A, B, C, D was the original order, classifier 1 would see A, B, B, C, classifier 2 would see A, B, D, D, the extreme one would see B, B, B and C. Now the next step is to actually look at that as every classifier sees all the examples in order A, B, C and D but with a weight attached. And so for the first classifier the weight would be 1 for A, 2 for B, 1 for Z and 0 for D. The extreme classifier would have 0 for A, a 3 for B, 1 for C, 0 for D. Now that looks promising. So about uh, in 2001 there was a very interesting paper called Online Bagging and Boosting authored by Oza and Russell where they had this following genius insight. Their insight was that we can actually approximate the binomial distribution with a Poisson distribution where the mean is set to 1. That gives you roughly the same behavior that the binomial distribution in the batch-based bagging has. So roughly about 37% of the time you get a zero weight, 37% of the time you get a weight of 1, 18% of the time you get a weight of 2, and higher weights are more and more unlikely, but still possible. Now, using that in online bagging makes it very easy. So whenever an example comes in, you just draw a weight from the Poisson distribution for the first classifier, another weight for the second classifier, and so for all the classifiers. Now we have a fully incremental setup. In MOA, we have algorithm called Edwin bagging that couples that with uh, Edwin as well for explicit change detection again. So we use Poisson with a mean of 1 to weight every example differently for every classifier but we also detect when things deteriorate so we do that by monitoring the overall performance of the ensemble and whenever things fall below a threshold we identify the worst classifier it is being removed and replaced by a new one. 
Now, in a number of experiments, what we also found is that we can improve on that by playing around with the parameters. So for the Poisson distribution, if we use a mean that is larger than 1, like 2, or maybe even up to 6, what we find is that across a large range of benchmark data sets to stream mining, we get better results. So we've uh, called it variant leverage in bagging. Again, it's coupled with Edwin for explicit change detection. Things go bad, you remove the worst classifier and replace it by a new one. So in summary, we've been looking at change in classifiers. Explicit change detection, hefting adaptive tree as a single classifier and two variants of bagging, admin bagging and leveraging bagging as an example of ensembles that deal explicitly with uh, change. Now I invite you to do your own experiments with more classifiers and change detection. For the purpose in more you will find that there are stream generators that also come with a component that simulates change over time. For instance in the random RBF generator you get drift by basically having the centers of the kernels move around in space. Thank you. Hello, welcome back to class 2 data stream mining in Weka MOA. So we arrived to the last lesson of this class. We are going to look at an application of classifying tweets. So let's start. Twitter is a very nice example of data stream because it's data that is produced on real time. So Twitter is a microblogging service that is built to discover what is happening at any moment in time. There are more than 300 million users, more than 2,000 million search queries every day. And a very nice thing for us is that data is public and it can be accessed through a streaming API. In this lesson, we are going to look at the application of sentiment analysis. So sentiment analysis is the task of classifying uh, messages or tweets into two categories, positive or negative, depending on the feelings that we can see inside the messages. Many times it's very difficult to get uh, labeled data. In uh, sentiment analysis with Twitter, there is a very basic approach, but it works very well, is that we can get uh, labeled data uh, using the tweets that they have uh, emoticons inside. So many tweets they have positives or negative emoticons, and then we can use this information to classify them as positive or negative. We can use all of these tweets uh, as a, to train our model and then we can uh, predict using the tweets that they don't have emoticons, we can predict what is the current uh, polarity, what is the current sentiment around uh, any uh, specific uh, product or company or, or topic. An important thing that we need to look when we are classifying tweets is that if data is balanced or not. So let's look at an example. So in this uh, simple confusing matrix, what we see is that we are predicting 82% uh, as positive and 18% of the instances as negative. What we see is that we are uh, classifying correctly th the positive class 75% of the instances and we are correcting the negative class 10% of the instances. So our accuracy in this case is 85%. Is this a good uh, performance? To answer this, one way is that we can look at a random classifier. Imagine a random classifier that is predicting randomly but is following the same distribution between positive class and negative class. So this is the confusion matrix in the bottom. So there we can see that this classifier is uh, getting also 82% of the instances as positives and is predicting as negative 18% interesting thing is that it's predicting the positive class correctly 68% of the time and the negative uh, is predicted correctly 3% of the instances. So that means that the accuracy here is 71%. So that means that if our classifier is predicting uh, with accuracy higher than this, then we can see, we can say that it's a good classifier, but if it's predicting uh, less than this 71%, then uh, our classifier is not doing quite well. To see this, this is, as you may know, there is this uh, Kappa statistic measure that what is measuring is this difference, the difference between our the accuracy of our classifier with the accuracy of a random classifier that is predicting using the same uh, distribution of classes. 
So basically, Kappa statistics computes this difference, and then it adds a normalizing factor, so we get a value of Kappa between 0 and, and 1. Now let's look at an application. So there is this Twitter sentiment corpus that was made by students at Stanford that uh, contains uh, tweets recollected between April 2009 and June 2009, where there are 800,000 tweets with positive emoticons and 800,000 tweets with negative emoticons. Uh, if we do a uh, frequential evaluation using these uh, tweets and we uh, use a naive Bayes multinomial classifier, stochastic gradient descent classifier, and a housing tree, what we see is that at the end of the stream, the stochastic gradient descent classifier gets an accuracy of 100%. So this is something that is not normal, and then uh, it's nice to see why is happening this. If we look at the Kappa statistic, what we see is that at the moment that the accuracy goes up to 100%, the Kappa statistic goes down. So that means that in that case, the data at that point starts to be completely unbalanced and completely only belonging to one class. In this data stream, if we compare accuracy and kappa of a multinomial knife base, stochastic gradient descent and housing tree classifier, what we can see is that uh, stochastic gradient descent is better, but this is something that uh, maybe not applied to other uh, data streams. What is very interesting is that in data stream mining, we should always not only look at accuracy, but also looking at the resources, at time and memory. So we have arrived to the end of this lesson. So in this lesson, we have seen an application of Twitter classification. Twitter is this microblogging stream service that is built to discover what is happening at any moment in time, and more specific, what is happening now. Mm, data may be unbalanced in many data streams. So it's always important not only look at accuracy, but also look at other measures as Kappa statistics. So thanks for being there. I hope you enjoy it. Bye bye. Hi, my name is Tony Smith. In this lesson, we're going to look at a practical application of data mining in the world of biology, knowledge discovery with biological data, or so-called bioinformatics. Now, there are many different types of biological problems that we might want to study, many different data types. I'm going to look at a uh, subset that's quite common called sequence analysis. So sequence of nucleotides that make up genes or sequences of amino acids that make up proteins. In fact, the latter. We're going to look at a very easily stated sequence uh, problem for proteins. It is, goes like this. Given a freshly produced protein, which portion of it is the signal peptide? Now, what does this mean? Well, you might remember from high school biology that along your DNA, there are nucleotide sequences called genes. Genes get copied with messenger RNA to produce a transcript, and that transcript is used to string together amino acids into a polypeptide chain, which is a protein. Now, proteins perform some function in a cell, and in order to do that, they must have to be transported to where they're going to perform that function. And through that transport, they have to pass through a membrane. And uh, in so doing, what happens is the uh, 20 or 30 or so amino acids at the beginning of the protein, they're called the signal peptide, they open up a translocation channel that allows the protein to pass through the membrane. And in so doing, the signal peptide portion gets cleaved off. So the signal peptide is kind of like a key that opens a door for a protein. And if we know what the key is, it gives us an idea as to what the function of the protein might be. So we want to predict where the signal peptide ends. Where is the cleavage point? And we first ask ourselves, what's our general goal? Do we want accurate prediction or do we want an explanatory model, something that gives us some knowledge? We'll have to ask what features might be relevant in predicting the cleavage site. So what features do we need to generate from the data we're given? What approach are we going to take? What learning algorithms in Weka we might use? And how are we going to know if the model produced by Weka is any good? How do we know if we're successful? So here's some uh, 10 instances or so of new proteins. As you can see, there are sequences of letters where each letter corresponds to a different type of amino acid. So M is methionine, A is alanine, S is serine, and so on. Nice to see you. Nice to be back. It's me again. This is uh, class three, interfacing to other data mining packages. We're going to concentrate on the R package. 
for most of this class, but just to begin with, we're going to look at the libSVM and liblinear packages. These are written by the same people. Uh, they're widely used outside of Weka, and they're also Weka's most popular packages. So you should install them. I've got them installed, and also you should install the grid search package as well. Both of these packages are to do with support vector machines. Weka already has the SMO implementation for support vector machines that we've seen before in the first course, but libSVM is more flexible and liblinear can be much faster. It's important to know that SVMs can be either linear or nonlinear through a kernel function mentioned very briefly in Lesson 4.5 of that earlier course. And also they can do classification or regression, which we haven't mentioned. Weka contains SMO reg for regression, the same algorithm. We're going to use the grid search uh, methods to optimize parameters for SVMs, which is quite important. So let's just look at libSVM and liblinear, these two packages, and also the standard SMO and SMO reg. All three implement linear SVMs. All but liblinear are capable of uh, accommodating nonlinear kernels. LibSVM does one class classification, which you will see in the activity associated with this lesson. LibLinear does logistic regression. It's uh, linear. We saw logistic regression in lesson 4.4 of the first course. LibLinear is very fast, and LibLinear can operate with the L1 norm, which I'm not going to explain in this lesson. So just a a uh, quick uh, look at liblinear. I did a speed test. I used the data generator on Weka's pre-process panel to generate 10,000 instances of this data, LED24. Liblinear took uh, two seconds to build the model. LibSVM took 18 seconds to build the model, but that's a slightly unfair comparison because it's using a non-linear kernel. So when I changed it to use a linear kernel, it took 10 seconds. And the SMO with the default parameters, which is a linear kernel, took uh, 21 seconds. So you can see liblinear is quite a lot faster. Now, let's just talk about linear boundaries and uh, support vector machines in general. Support vector machines try to drive a channel between the two classes. Here we've got the blue class and the green class, and they try and drive a channel kind of halfway between the classes to leave as large a margin as possible. In this case, uh, we've got zero errors on the training data and a pretty small margin, the distance between the dashed lines. However, when we look at the test data. Now this is an artificial data set, but in this case you can see that some points in the test data are being classified incorrectly, four points in fact. If instead of using this line, we used, we turned it a bit and used a line with a much larger margin, although it makes one error on the training data, this particular, in this particular situation it gets all of the test data correct, no errors on the test data. So it's an advantage sometimes to have a large margin, even at the expense of errors on the training data. SVMs try to give you large margin classifiers. And here we are with a nonlinear data set. I've uh, drawn a linear boundary here, the boundary that's produced by liblinear or libSVM with a linear kernel, or indeed the SMO package and the SMO classifier in Weka. And this gives uh, 21 errors on the data set, on the training set. Here's a nonlinear boundary for the same data set implemented by libSVM with an RBF kernel. I've got this data set open in Weka's boundary visualizer over here, and I'm going to just choose uh, libSVM. Luckily I've installed the package already and I just start. Okay, let's speed this up. There we are, that's the result, and you can see it's making some errors down here and up here on the data set, on the training set. Let's just go to the Explorer. I've got the same data file open and I'm going to go again to libSVM and take a look uh, we're plotting the training set here, so uh, if I look at that, I get a total of nine errors, four and five, respectively, on the different uh, different training set parts. That's with the default parameters. If I change the libSVM parameters, then I can get this boundary. Now, this is uh, quite a good boundary because it uh, gives zero errors on the training set, but it gives poor generalization because it doesn't drive a channel right right between those two classes. With different parameters, I can continue to get zero errors on the training set and a much more satisfactory boundary, which will probably generalize better. Whenever you use 
non-linear support vector machines, you need to optimize the parameters. And the parameters we're talking about are called cost and gamma. When we optimize parameters in Weka, we use the grid search method, which is in the meta category. This is the parameters for grid search. And the default configuration for grid search, well, let's look at it. Down at the bottom, it says use a SMO reg, that's the default, and evaluate using the correlation coefficient. We're going to need to change those. And then the first six boxes are talking about X of the grid, and the next six boxes about Y. The property being optimized, the X property being optimized is called C, and that's going from 10 cubes down to 10 to the minus 3 in multiplicative steps of 10. That's what those first six parameters signify. And the second six parameters give the same range with the Y property of kernel dot gamma. That's for SMO reg. If we want to use libSVM, we need to change some things. We're going to optimize the properties cost and gamma. We're going to choose the classifier libSVM, and we're going to evaluate using accuracy. So let me set that up in Weka. I'm going to choose grid search from the meta category. And in grid search, I'm going to first of all uh, choose the classifier. I'm going to choose uh, SM, lib SVM. I'm going to optimize the, uh, let's move this up so that you can see, optimize the accuracy. And then the two properties involved are cost and gamma. If I run that, oh, it's finished here, and the result is an accuracy uh, is the parameters are a thousand for the x coordinate that's cost and ten for the y coordinate that's gamma and we've got a hundred percent accuracy with that data set well we could see we were going to get a hundred percent accuracy when we looked at the boundary visualization that's for lib svm if we were to choose a different method like smo it's got different parameters so let me just look at smo here I'm going to choose SMO. I need to find the appropriate parameters. Here's the SMO parameters. And uh, I want C here for the cost. And uh, if I look in the kernel, I want an RBF kernel. And in the RBF kernel, one of the, the key parameter here is gamma. So it's kernel dot gamma. Kernel here dot gamma here. So I'm going to use C and kernel dot gamma, C and kernel dot gamma, and that would allow me to optimize SMO. Okay, so grid search is fairly complicated to use, but it's necessary to optimize the parameters when using nonlinear support vector machines. So here's a summary. We've looked at liblinear, which does uh, all things linear, linear SVMs, logistic regression, uh, and it can use the L1 norm, which minimizes the sum of absolute values, not the sum of squares, which has big advantages under certain conditions, and is very fast. LibSVM is all things SVM, linear and nonlinear SVMs. So the practical advice when you want to use SVMs is first use a linear SVM, do it quickly with liblinear perhaps and see how you get on, and then for a nonlinear SVM select the uh, RBF kernel. But when you select a nonlinear kernel like RBF, it's really important to optimize cost and gamma, and you can do this using the grid search method. Here's a reference to uh, support vector machines to uh, uh, these packages. And uh, the activity, as I said before, will involve you looking at one class classification, an interesting thing that LibSVM can do. Good luck with that, and we'll see you later. Hello, my name is Albert Frank. I'm with the Department of Computer Science at the University of Waikato, the home of Weka, and it is my job to tell you a bit about how to use the statistical computing environment R from Weka. So let's get started. Because R is implemented in a different programming language than Weka, which is implemented in Java, getting things set up so that Weka can use R is a little bit tricky. But we will go through the steps in this first video. The following assumes that you're using 64-bit Windows, 64-bit R, and 64-bit Java. You can also do the same if you use 32-bit versions of everything. 
Furthermore, we'll assume that you have administrator access on your computer and we assume that you have a direct connection to the internet. All right, the first thing we need to do is download R and install it. Download R. Download R 3.2.2 for Windows. That's the current version. And now we should download it by clicking on this download link here. But to save some time, I've already downloaded R and we can just install it from here. Okay, we accept this, we run the installer. We want English as the language and we just accept the license which is the same as the one used for Weka. We accept the default install location. Now because I want to use 64-bit R, I unselect 32-bit files here. And then I just go with the standard setup and I also want to create a start menu folder and we accept the defaults here as well okay finished now we have installed R the first thing we should do is install a particular package in R that is necessary for R to be able to communicate with Java the programming environment that Weka is implemented in so we start R from this shortcut and we get the R console where we can enter text commands. This is the standard way to interact with R because R is really a, a programming language. So we type in install.packages and then in quotes and brackets R Java. Okay, we want to install this in the personal library and we want to create this library. And because I'm in New Zealand, I want to download R uh, from a New Zealand computer, New Zealand server, so I click on New Zealand here. Okay, R uh, Java has been installed successfully. So we just um, close this and now what we need to do next is set up some environment variables. So we search for variables using the Windows search functionality and then we click the item edit environment variables for your account right there are already some environment variables there we need to add some new ones we click on new to enter a new variable this new variable is called r underscore home and the variable value is the location of the r distribution to find this we right click on the r shortcut and we go on properties and now we have the location of the R distribution here. It's the path to the directory containing the R binaries. So we select everything by, um, up to the bin folder. Okay. And then we paste it here. All right. So that's the R underscore home variable. The next variable we need to insert is the R libs user variable, which determines the location of the user libraries that R installs. Now we've already installed one user library, namely the R Java library, so we just need to find it and put the location of this library here. So let's just use the Windows search functionality again to search for R Java. It's a file folder. Okay, and now we just go up one level. This is the folder containing all the user libraries for R. So we right click on this text field and we select copy address as text to copy this path. Then we go back to our form to enter the variable value for our user variable. We right click and we paste it in. Okay. We're almost done now. The last thing we need to do is modify the path environment variable to include the directory containing the R executable. So we select this path environment variable and click on the edit button and at the end we add a semicolon and then we use the location of the R executable. So in this case we actually use this bit of the path for the 
uh, executable. Okay, this should be it. Now we just go OK here. And now what we need to do is install the R plugin package for Weka, which is Weka's interface for R. So we start Weka. And we go to the package manager. Just refreshes the package cache at the start. Once it's done that and popped up the window, we can select the R plugin. R plugin is here. We choose the install button. Okay. Right, there's quite a bit of information here in this window install information for the R plugin. This is about setting the environment variables that we've just set before. So we just click OK here. Now it takes a little while for R to be downloaded and installed, but it doesn't take too long. It actually also installs uh, an additional R library, the Java GD library for R, which makes it possible to output R plots in Java. Okay, now it's finished. We just need to restart Weka. So we close this, close this. Start Weka again. Okay, and now when we start the Explorer, we can load in some data. So in this case, just go to the program files folder, and then the Weka folder, and then there's a data folder. We load in the iris data. And now we can go to the R console, which is a new tab here that comes as part of the R plugin package, which provides us with a console for R implemented in Java. And this console allows us to address the data that we've loaded in the pre-process panel using the name R data. So we can go plot and in brackets R data. And this will give us a plot of the iris data generated by R. Okay, that's it for this video. We will look at the R console a bit more next time. See you later. So how we can install the R plugin for Weka so that we can use some of the functionality in R from Weka and we saw how we can issue a simple command in the R console in the Weka Explorer to plot some data. Today we're going to look a bit more at the extensive plotting functionalities in R. More specifically we look at the ggplot2 package for R and what kinds of plots we can generate with this package. Okay, let's get started. To save some time, I've loaded the iris data into the Weka Explorer already. Now we go to the R console to issue our commands in the R language. The first thing we need to do is install the ggplot2 package, which is the plot plotting package that we want to use. Install.packages and then in brackets and double quotes ggplot2. Okay, it's finished. Now that we've downloaded and installed the package, we can load it into the R environment by using the library function. So we use library and then in brackets ggplot2. Okay, now the library is loaded and we can use it to plot some data. In ggplot2, we construct a plot in layers. We can add several different layers of plots to construct very complex plots. But there's one layer that is always present in every plot. That is the data layer, which specifies the data that needs to be plotted. The data layer is specified using the ggplot function. So with the ggplot function, we specify the data we want to use. In this case, the data is referred to using the rdata variable. Rdata is the name of the variable that refers to the data that we've loaded into the preprocess panel. 
And then we need to also say which attributes in the data we want to use. This is done using the aesthetics function, the AES function. As a second argument, we use the result returned by the aesthetics function. We say x equals petal length to specify the petal length attribute as the attribute we want to plot. In this case, we're just generating a plot based on a single attribute in the data. Okay, this is now the data layer for our plot. We also need to add a geometry layer, which actually specifies what type of plot we want to generate. Let's say we want to generate a kernel density estimate based on this attribute that we have selected. Then we add another layer to our plot using the plus operator and we call the geometry function for density estimates geom underscore density. Okay, let's try this. Right, so now we have a kernel density estimate for the petal length attribute. On the x-axis we have the value of the petal length attribute and on the y-axis we have the density estimate. And you can see that there are two peaks in this density estimate. But you can also see that the plot is not wide enough to cover the entire area that is relevant. So we should increase the limits of the plot and we can use that by adding a call to the xlim function where we specify the lower limit and the upper limit. Let's say we use 0 as the lower limit and 8 as the upper limit. Okay, that looks better, but perhaps this kernel density estimate is still a little bit too smooth doesn't show enough detail in the data because the kernels that are used are too wide. So let's reduce the width of each kernel. We can do that by specifying the adjust argument for the geom underscore density function. This multiplies the width of each kernel by the given parameter. Let's say we halve the width of each kernel estimator. Now we get a plot showing a little bit more detail. In Weka, we primarily deal with classification problems. So really, we should try to take the class information into account in our plot. We can do that by generating three different plots, one for each class value, and combine them in one graph. How do we do that? It's very simple. We just add another argument to the call of the aesthetics function. We just say the color is given by the class attribute in our data. Class is the name of the class attribute in the iris data. We just say the color is based on the class attribute. And now we get a separate kernel density estimate for each of the three classes. You can see that the distributions for iris versicola and iris virginica overlap a little bit, but iris setosa is nicely separated. We may want to enhance this plot by filling the area under each estimate. This is also easy. It's again done by providing an additional argument to the aesthetics function. We just say the fill color should also be based on the class attribute. You can see that there is a little bit of a problem here. We can't really differentiate the iris versicola and the iris virginica cases. We should introduce some transparency in our plot. And we can do that by providing an alpha value for our kernel density estimators. This is a value between 0 and 1 that determines the amount of transparency. 1 means no transparency, 0 means totally transparent. Let's set this to 0.5. So now we have a nice plot of the three kernel density estimates. Let's say we want to plot the same kind of plot but for all four attributes in the iris data, not just the petal length attribute. We can also do that, but we need to massage our data a little bit to achieve that. We need to load a library called reshape2. Library reshape2. How to use R from Weka. More specifically, we look at how to use the MLR library from Weka. MLR stands for Machine Learning in R. This library includes many of the learning algorithms that are available in the R environment, all nicely bundled up in one package. As we'll see, it's quite easy to use MLR from Weka. 
there is a particular classifier that can be used to do this. Ok, so let's have a look at how this classifier works. I have loaded the diabetes data into the explorer so that we can process it using MLR learning algorithms. One way to use MLR is to just use the R console. We've seen last time that we can, for example, plot the data in the R console by referring to the data using R data. This will plot the data that we have loaded into the preprocess panel. We can also use the MLR learning algorithms from this console by typing in commands. However, that is a little bit inconvenient. Instead, we can use the MLR classifier by selecting it under the classify panel. We select the choose button to choose the MLR classifier. As you have seen, this has taken a while because Weka actually needs to download and install the MLR package in R the first time we want to use it. However, once this has happened, we don't need to install the package again, so this will be much faster in the future. Okay, now you can see here that we have an MLR package in the classifiers package. And there's an MLR classifier there, so let's select that. The MLR classifier wraps the MLR R library for building and making predictions using various R classifiers and regression methods. Right, just like with any other Wecker classifier, we have the text box up here, which contains the configuration information for the MLR classifier. Let's just run it with default settings. We press the start button, and by default, the MLR classifier runs the R part learning algorithm in R. This builds a classification tree from the data using the CART decision tree learning method. We can see that it gets 75% accuracy in the cross-validation on the diabetes data. And we get all the other performance statistics that we are used to as well. So really, we treat the learning algorithm in R just like any other Weka learning algorithm. For this to happen, behind the scenes, the MLR classifier actually has to transfer the data into the R environment, build the classifier in the R environment, and then also feed the test data to the classifier in the R environment and get the predictions back. But it all happens transparently. Further up, we can see the tree that has been generated from this data in textual form. We also get some information on the learning algorithm that was used and the package it originally comes from. So we used RPART, which is a classification algorithm. So in MLR, it's called classif.rpart. This learning algorithm comes from the RPART package, which is a separate package for R. The MLR package for R just bundles algorithms from a lot of other packages that are available in R in one convenient interface, which we can easily make use of using the MLR classifier. Okay, the name is given here and also some properties of this algorithm. So it can deal with two classes, can deal with multiple classes, can deal with missing values, numeric variables, numeric attributes in other words, factors, which are nominal attributes. It could also potentially deal with ordinal attributes. It can produce probability estimates and it can deal with instance weights. Okay, so this is the R part learning algorithm from R but there are many other learning algorithms that are available in the MLR package and most of them are available through the MLR classifier. We can choose the algorithm we want to use by using the R learner property. By default here we can see that R part is chosen but there are many other algorithms that we can choose from. There are many classification algorithms and there are also many regression algorithms. Right. Let's run one other classification algorithm in MLR. Let's run random ferns. This is available as classif.rferns. Living in New Zealand, I'm quite fond of ferns and it's intriguing to see that there's also a learning algorithm that generates random ferns. Now you can see that when I've clicked this, nothing happens for a while because Weka actually has to download and install the rferns package. But that has happened now and we can use this classifier. A fern is a variant of a decision tree where all the tests 
at one level of the decision tree are exactly the same. So they all test the same attribute and they perform the same split of the data. So a fern is a restricted form of a decision tree. Just like the random forest classifier does for regular decision trees, it generates an ensemble of ferns. Okay, let's try this. Right. Okay, so this classifier is slightly less accurate than the R part classifier, but there may be other data sets where it outperforms R part because it is an ensemble classifier. And you've seen that it runs quite quickly. It has actually generated an ensemble of 1000 ferns and the depth was restricted to 5. So maybe we should try to decrease the depth to reduce the chance of overfitting. We can also specify parameters for the learning algorithm here in the learner params field of MLR classifier. To find out some information about the parameters that we can use, we actually need to go on the web. It's best to go to the list of learning algorithms that are available in the MLR library first. To do that, we just search for MLR integrated learners and we search for the release version of MLR. There's also a development version. Okay, so the first link here is the link we want. We have the integrated learners here. This has a list of all the learning algorithms that are in the MLR package and most of them are available through the MLR classifier in Weka. We want to look for R ferns. So I search for R ferns on this page and there's a link here. This will take us to the appropriate documentation page. It has a list of all the topics that are in the manual for the R ferns package for R. R ferns is the actual learning method. So let's click on this. Right. And here we have some information on the usage of the method. We have arguments that can be used in R. X and Y is just the data. We can ignore that. That's filled in by Weka, by the MLR classifier. Formula, we can also ignore that. And data, yes, we can ignore that as well. But here we can see some relevant parameters that we might want to change. We can change the depth, for example, of the ferns, and we can change the number of ferns. So let's change the depth. Let's try to reduce it in our experiment. So what we do is we type depth equals perhaps 2, if we want to reduce the depth to 2. And then let's rerun the experiment. We start it again. Right. We can also specify multiple parameters. We can change the number of trees that we want to generate. So by using the ferns argument, we can say how many ferns we want to include in our ensemble. To specify multiple arguments, we just separate them by a comma. So ferns equals 100 will generate 100 ferns instead of 1000. Okay, so this runs even more quickly now. And the accuracy has actually slightly gone up. This is most likely due to chance. We've seen now how we can use MLR classifier from Weka. And you can also run MLR classifier from the other user interfaces in Weka. You can run it from the Weka experimenter. You can run it from the command line and you can also run it from the knowledge flow. Next time, we'll look at how to use our tools for pre-processing in the knowledge flow of Weka. See you then. Hi. In the last video, we saw how we can use the MLR classifier in Weka to run learning algorithms implemented in R from within Weka. Before that, we saw how we can use the R console in Weka to run R commands, for example, to plot data. In today's lesson, we'll see how we can use the pre-processing tools implemented in R to pre-process data 
before we pass that data on to Weka learning algorithms. Okay, let's get started. We will use the knowledge flow environment in Weka to process data in R and then pass it on to a Weka learning algorithm. The knowledge flow environment, once the R plugin has been installed, provides an R script executor component that executes a user supplied R script. So we can put this on the canvas and then right click on it or double click on it to configure it. What we can see here is that we can enter an R script or we can load a script from a file. Right, before we start with our script, we should load some data. So we need a data source. Let's use an R floater data source. Okay, maybe we just use the iris data to start off with. And then we make a data set connection to our R script executor. So now the data will be loaded as an R file in Java, then it will be passed to the R environment and the data that is processed by this R script will be passed back into Weka so that, for example, we can visualize it. And we can put a scatter plot matrix here. And then once we've configured our R script, we can connect it up to the R script executor. Something very simple that we can do in our R script is to delete one of the attributes from the incoming data. The incoming data is referred to by the name R data, just as it's done in the R console in the Explorer as well. And then in brackets, we can specify which columns of this data we want to keep. Let's say we just want to keep the first four attributes in the data and discard the class attribute. Now, this command will be executed and then the result will be passed into Weka as an R file. So we can now connect our R script executor component to the scatterplot matrix component using a data set connection. Right. Let's try this. So we run the flow. And now let's check the plot by right clicking on the component. As we can see, we've got a scatter plot matrix here, which has four of the attributes, but not the class attribute. So it all worked as intended. Let's try something more sophisticated. We want to pre-process the data using one of R's many pre-processing tools. More specifically, we want to use independent component analysis to decompose the input data into statistically independent components. We want to do that using the fast ICA library in R. So first we need to install this library in R. We can do that from the knowledge flow if we enable the R perspective. Perspectives allow us to implement additional functionality in the knowledge flow there's an R console perspective here. Let's tick this. Okay. Now you can see up here we have an additional R console, which is just the same as the R console in the Explorer. So to install the fast ICA package, we can just go install packages fast ICA. Now that this is installed, we can use the library in our R script. So we go back to the data mining processes perspective, and now we can change our script to make use of this fast ICA library. First of all, we need to load the library into R. So we have library fast ICA as the first statement in our script. Now, for convenience, let's just define a variable that allows us to specify the number of components we want to extract from our data. Let's say we want to extract as many components as there are predictor attributes in our data. So we say num equals n call, which is the function that gives us the number of columns in the data, n call of r data minus 1. So this would be 4 in the case of the iris data. Now we can call the fast ICA function. Fast ICA, we specify the data we want to use. We go from 1 to num. These are the columns that we want to perform our independent component analysis on. And then we say how many components we want to extract. Also num. Right. Now, fast ICA actually returns a list of results in R. Now, if we check the fast ICA documentation on the web, we see that there are actually several things that are returned by the fast ICA function. 
let's search for fast ICA documentation R and this page here at the rdocumentation.org site looks helpful right now if you look at the documentation for the function you can see that it returns several values it returns the pre-processed data matrix and then several other things what we want here is the estimated source matrix the source consists of the estimated components the independent components so we want to use the s value from the result and we can get that value by adding dollar sign s at the end of the invocation of the function so this will extract the independent components from the result. Right, we are almost done now. This will actually return the independent components as a matrix. However, to be able to pass the data back into Weka, we need to make this matrix into a data frame. To make this into a data frame, we can just call the data frame function, data.frame, and we put the whole thing into brackets. Let's try this out. Now we should see the independent components that have been extracted from the data. They are called x1 to x4. You can see here that the independent component analysis has produced the desired results. For example, if you look at the relationship between x1 and x4, those two uh, components look pretty much statistically independent. So we've run independent component analysis on the data and passed the data back into the Weka environment. Let's run a learning algorithm on this data. As you know, the naive base learning algorithm assumes that the attributes are conditionally independent given the class attribute. So it's a plausible hypothesis to assume that data preprocessed using ICA is easier to classify using naive base. In order to run a supervised learning algorithm on the data, we need to attach the original class labels to the data again. We can do that quite easily using the cbind function, the column bind function in R. So we go cbind and then the two sets of columns that we want to bind together. Now here we need to assign this data to a variable. Let's call this variable D so that we can refer to it in the cbind function. We want to bind the columns in D and the class column in the R data data frame. We address this column using square brackets again and the index of this column is num plus one that's the last column in our R data so that's the class column in the iris data so now we will have labeled data let's try this okay now we can see that the class attribute has been added so we have the data decomposed into independent components using ICA and then labeled again with the original class labels. So now we can run a learning algorithm on this data, for example, naive base. What we need to do is go into the evaluation package and choose the class assigner to assign the class attribute to our data. We make a data set connection to this class assigner. By default, it just uses the last attribute. So this is fine. Then we pass the data to the cross validation fold maker. And from there, we pass the data to Naive Base. Both the training set and the test set. And after we have added the classifier, we need to evaluate the classifier. So we take a classifier performance evaluator and we use a batch classifier connection to connect naive base to it. Right. And finally, we want to see the output of the evaluation process. So we use a text viewer and we use a text connection from the classifier performance evaluator. Right. So let's run this flow. Okay. It's finished and we can get the cross validated accuracy now in this text viewer. 98% accuracy. This is quite a high accuracy on the iris data. So it looks like independent component analysis has helped to improve performance. Note that strictly speaking, we have performed semi-supervised learning in this experiment because we used an unsupervised feature extraction method on the whole data set before we applied cross-validation on the data set. Right, this was to show you a bit of how to use R from the knowledge flow. 
We've covered all the aspects of how to use R in Weka now. So that's it for this topic. See you later. Here in lesson 3.6, we're going to talk about a very interesting application of using Weka for classifying functional MRI data. Classifying these data can be very challenging for a number of reasons. First of all, these data are very high dimensional. A structural MRI scan can consist of approximately 100,000 voxels, and an fMRI scan records signals from these voxels over time, resulting in four-dimensional data. The number of possible features and attributes that can be derived from these data are very large. And one of the recent events that highlights why this can be problematic was the ADHD 200 Global Machine Learning Competition. The goal of this competition was to predict a subject's diagnosis as either typically developing or ADHD using a combination of demographic and structural and functional neuroimaging features. A number of sites from around the world collaborated to provide data for this competition. This resulted in approximately 800 subjects worth of data uh, in, the, in the training set, as well as 200 data, subjects worth of data in the test set, where the diagnosis was unknown to the participants in the competition. My team participated in this competition, and our first goal was to figure out how to derive meaningful information from structural MRI data. The first thing we did was calculate free surfer metrics used for automated brain parcellation. This resulted in nine different attributes like brain volume from 68 different cortical regions, as well as three different measures from each of 45 different subcortical and non-cortical brain regions. Collectively, this resulted in more than 700 structural brain attributes using just the SMRI data. Our next step was to determine how to extract features from the resting state functional MRI data. The first thing we did was calculate resting state functional connectivity matrices, or pairwise time series correlations between different brain regions. We then calculated the total number of independent components used that were required to, to describe 99% of the data variants. We also calculated power spectra, regional homogeneity, and a number of different graph theoretic metrics like functional modular organization. Overall, this resulted in more than 100,000 functional neuroimaging attributes. My team, my team, as it turns out, placed third in this competition using a voter perceptron as implemented in Weka. But the overall results of this competition were very unsatisfying, as it turned out the winning team used only demographic features, a very small number of attributes overall. Classification using these features alone. My name is Mark Hall. I'm a software architect and data mining consultant with the Pentaho Corporation. I live here in New Zealand, not very far away from where the Weka software was originally developed. This lesson is about using Weka in a distributed processing framework, such as Spark or Hadoop. So let's get on with it. So distributed Weka is a plugin for Weka 3.7 that allows Weka algorithms to run on a cluster of machines. You would use this when your data set is too large to load into main RAM on your desktop, or you are perhaps applying an algorithm that would just take too long to run on a single machine. In class two, you covered data stream mining. You saw sequential online algorithms that can be used to handle large data sets in the MOA framework and also inside of Weka using MOA. Distributed Weka works with distributed processing frameworks that use something called MapReduce. So this is a little bit different. It's more suited to large offline batch-based processing scenarios. So essentially your data is divided up over the nodes in a processing cluster, the machines in a processing cluster, and is conquered. Each piece is conquered independently of the other pieces. More on MapReduce shortly. The distributed Weka plugin is actually made up of two packages. First, there is something called distributed Weka base. So this is a package that provides general MapReduce style tasks for machine learning that are not tied to any particular MapReduce framework implementation. We'll discuss MapReduce in just a second. It uh, includes tasks for training classifiers and clusterers and computing summary statistics and correlations from the data. A second package is needed in order to apply the base package or the algorithms in the base package within a particular implementation of the MapReduce programming model. 
So in this lesson, we're going to be looking at uh, a uh, implementation for the Spark distributed processing environment. So we need, we'll need to install something called distributed Weka Spark as well. So this is a wrapper for the base tasks that works on the Spark platform. There is also a package, or several actually, that work with Hadoop, depending on which version or flavor of Hadoop that you have installed. So now let's return to MapReduce. MapReduce is the main pro processing model used by distributed frameworks such as Spark and Hadoop. MapReduce programs involve two phases, a map phase followed by a reduce phase. To start with, we have a data set, probably a large data set. This data set is divided up into disjoint subsets. The framework takes care of doing this for us. It then feeds a split of the data, a subset of the data, into a map task. Now map tasks do their processing independently of all other map tasks. They're not aware of it, any of the other data splits or what the other tasks that may be running in parallel are doing. So the kind of operations that map tasks do include sorting the data perhaps, filtering it in some way, or computing some kind of partial result. The output of map tasks are these partial results associated with a distinct key value. Now the key values allow the framework to group together related intermediate results and pass them on to reduce tasks. So the reduce tasks job is to take all of the values associated with one distinct key and aggregate them in some fashion. So they may count or add or do some averaging or some kind of aggregation which produces a final result. Now the job of the MapReduce framework itself is to provide all of this orchestration. So as I said, they handle splitting up the data for us. They handle invoking and initializing the map and reduce tasks. They provide redundancy and fault tolerance as well. So if there is some failure out on the cluster which causes map tasks to uh, abort processing before they've finished or a reduced task to fail, the framework will take care of uh, ensuring that there are additional map and reduce tasks that can be started up to take care of and complete the processing. Okay, so the design goals of distributed Weka were to provide a similar experience to that of using standalone desktop Weka. So it enables you to use any classification or regression learner in Weka, and also has some support for clustering as well. It also generates output, including evaluation output, that looks just like that produced by standard desktop Weka. The models that are output from distributed Weka are normal Weka models. So that means that they can be saved to your file system, loaded into desktop Weka at a later stage, and used for making predictions, just like any other Weka model. So one thing that wasn't a goal of the package, initially at least, was to provide distributed implementations of every learning algorithm in Weka. One exception to this is k-means clustering, which was written specifically to work within the frameworks such as Spark and Hadoop. So we'll see exactly how Weka handles distributing uh, different types of models in a later lesson. So that's pretty much the end of our first lesson on distributed Weka. We learned what distributed Weka is. We've learned when you would want to use it, under what conditions you would want to use it. We've learned what map use is, and we've taken a look at the basic design goals of distributed Weka. Okay, so in the next lesson, we'll take a look at installing distributed Weka verifying that it's been installed correctly, and we'll start to take a look at some of the examples that come with distributed Weka. All right, so until next time. Hello again. Last time we learned a little bit about what distributed Weka is, and a little bit about the map or reduce framework. In this lesson, we're going to install distributed Weka and start to use some of the components that come with it. So let's get started. Okay, so here we are in Weka's package manager, which I'm sure you're all familiar with by now. What we're going to do here is scroll down a little bit in the package list, and we are going to install distributed Weka for Spark. And here it is, just down here. Okay, so if I click install with this one selected, it asks me um, or it tells me that I'm going to install the following packages. 
distributed worker for Spark version 1.0.2. We click yes, we click OK, and then it tells me that in order to dis install this, we need also to install distributed worker base 1.0.12. So at this stage, I'll click no because I already have this installed and uh, we won't show it installing at the moment because the download is fairly large for distributed Weka Spark and it'll take a little while and I already have it installed. Okay, once you've dis installed distributed Weka, you need to make sure that you restart Weka so that the packages or the newly installed packages are loaded correctly. So the main way to interact with distributed Weka is through the knowledge flow environment. This allows us to chain together processing components in such a fashion that a given component will not execute until the previous one has completed executing. So it's also possible to use distributed Weka from the command line, but the graphical user interface provided by the knowledge flow is a very convenient and easy way to edit the sometimes many parameters that are involved in setting up a distributed Weka job. So let's verify that our installation of distributed Weka has proceeded correctly. All right, so in the Weka knowledge flow environment, you can see that there is, on the left-hand side in the design palette, a new folder called Spark. If we open this up, we should find that there are a bunch of new components available to us. In particular, we have something called an ARF header Spark job. We have a Weka classifier Spark job a Weka classifier evaluation Spark job, and several others as well that we'll discuss shortly. The distributed Weka for Spark package also comes with a bunch of example template flows. So, in the last lesson, we installed distributed Weka and ran our first distributed Weka for Spark job that analyzed and computed a header for the hypothyroid data set. In this lesson, we'll take a closer look at how these jobs are configured and we'll run a few more jobs that uh, use Weka classification algorithms, learned classification models on the hypothyroid data. So let's get started. Okay, here is the job that we ran last time. I've loaded it back up into the knowledge flow here. Let's take a look at how it's configured. So if I double click on the ARF header Spark job component here on the canvas, it'll bring up the configuration dialog, of which is made up of two tabs. Here. So the first tab is entitled Spark Configuration, and as the name suggests, there are a bunch of options here related to how the cluster is configured. Uh, so up at the top, we have uh, a couple of options that are uh, related to how Spark handles or manages memory out on the cluster. We won't go into detail about exactly how those work, but suffice to say that the defaults that are set here uh, work reasonably well for most uh, situations. Under that, there is something called the input file parameter, and that's uh, most important because it's the data set that we're operating on. You can see here that it's pre-configured to point to the hypothyroid data, which is in this sample data directory, which is in turn in uh, the package installation directory for a distributed Weka for Spark. Then we have the master po post parameter, this is where you can specify the address of the machine that the master Spark process is running on. In our case, we don't have a Spark cluster. We're running locally on our desktop machine. And Spark is treating each of the processing cores uh, in our CPU as a um, processing node. So that's why we have the local word specify here, specified here. And in parentheses, we have an asterisk which tells Spark that we want to make use of all of our available processing cores. If we wanted to limit the number of cores that Spark uses on our desktop machine, then we could place a number inside of those parentheses there uh, to limit that. Similarly, the master port uh, would be used if we were running against a, a cluster and uh, we needed to provide the port uh, that the, the Spark uh, master process is listening on. Further down in the list here, we can see something called the output directory. This is where uh, Weka will be saving any results generated by the job. Okay, the last uh, parameter we'll take a look at here is called min input slices. 
With this parameter, we're telling Spark how many logical chunks to split the data set up into. So Spark will create partitions or slices of the data set and process those. And it uses one worker task uh, running on a core on the CPU of a processing node in order to process a given partition. So here we can really have some control over the level of parallelism applied to our data set. If we had a processing cluster of 25 machines where each machine had a CPU with four cores, then Spark would be working at maximum efficiency if we chose uh, 100 input slices or fewer for our data set. That way we would have the entire data set processed in one wave of tasks. Let's take a quick look at the second configuration panel in the dialog here, entitled ARF Header Spark Job. So if we click on that, this relates to how uh, Weka will parse the CSV file, our hypothyroid data. So there are a lot of options here related to CSV parsing. So what the field separator is, uh, what the date format might be, if there are date attributes and so forth. And we can also tell Weka, since this is a headerless CSV file, what the names of the attributes are in the data. And we can do that in one of two ways, either by typing a comma separated list of attribute names in this first text box at the top here, or we can point Weka to a file on the file system that contains the names of the attributes. So we're using that option in this case by saying that there is a file called hypothyroid.names on the file system. And the format of that file is, is a simple one. It just contains one attribute name per line in the file. Well, we also have this option called uh, path to existing header here. So if we have already run this job and created an ARF header file and computed all our summary statistics, then there is no need for the job to run again. But we may have it as a component in an overall larger job. So in that case, we can provide the path to the file that uh, uh, the header file that was created in a previous execution and Weka will then realize that it does not need to regenerate that file. And the last dialog box here uh, is one where we tell it what we want to call that ARF header file when it gets created. In this case, we're calling it hypo.arf. Again, you recall last time we ran the example knowledge flow template that built two different classifiers in this Spark environment, a naive Bayes classifier and a JRIP classifier but we found that it did something different with the JRIP classifier than it did with Naive Bayes. It actually ended up building four separate JRIP classifiers and wrapping them up in a voted ensemble. In this lesson, we'll take a closer look at exactly what happened there and the reasons for why there is a difference between the Naive Bayes example and the JRIP example. So let's get started. Okay, here is that knowledge flow template we ran last time. And if we open up the text viewer, we can refresh our memories as to what the results look like. So at the top, we had the Naive Bayes classifier on our hypothyroid data set. And we ended up with one model, as we expected. The second classifier that ran in this example was JRIP. And as we can see from the results, we ended up with four sets of JRIP rules and that these were combined in a voted meta-classifier. So the question was, why did this happen? Let's take a closer look at it and I'll attempt to explain. Okay, so here is a slide that attempts to describe how the processing occurs in Spark for our classifier job. So on the left-hand side, we have the ARF header Spark job, which initially loads the data into main memory for us. It loads the CSV data and creates one of Spark's resilient distributed data sets with a number of splits or partitions, as they're called at Spark. Each partition is processed by a, a worker out on the cluster, or in our case, by a CPU core on our, our desktop machine. The map tasks process these partitions and create models. Or to be more precise, they create partial models. So in the case of Naive Bayes, uh, the algorithm is fairly simple, and the model is comprised of a number of probability estimators, all of which can be computed incrementally and additively. So when it comes to combining 
these probability estimators, we can simply add together their statistics and we end up with one final model which is identical to that that we would get if we ran naive base sequentially on, it, on the data set on our desktop. In the case of other types of classifiers and uh, tree learners and rule learners like JRipper, an example of that, it's somewhat more difficult to try and aggregate these partial models into one final model, which would be the same as if you were to run sequentially. So in that case, Weka takes the easy route of taking the, the partial models or the, or, the, or the smaller models, which are learned on the splits of the data, and combining them by simply making a voted ensemble out of them. Okay, we're nearly finished with this example. But before we leave, there are a couple more aspects to touch on. So one is output. We've seen some output in the text viewer here in the knowledge flow. But I mentioned earlier that uh, the jobs in distributed Weka also store output on the file system. This can be our local file system, or if we're using Hadoop and Hadoop's distributed file system, it could be stored in HDFS. So anyway, if we take a look in the source of the data here, our, our header Spark job, recall that we saw we had some setup for our input files and also our output directory down here. So this is where the jobs will store their output. Let's take a look at that on the file system. So if I find my home directory, then I can see that directory that was specified in the configuration there, Spark Output. If we go into that directory, we can see a couple of subfolders. So one is where the ARF header was stored by the ARF header job. We can look in there and we can see hypo.arf. And if we go back out and look in this model directory, we can see the uh, models that were created by distributed Weka. So we have one for uh, Nanai Bayes and one for the voted JRIP model. Okay. The other thing we haven't mentioned is this job in the middle here called the randomly shuffled data spark job. So what does this do? Well, as the name suggests, it's a job that in a distributed fashion randomly shuffles the order of the rows or instances in the data set that was being processed. So in some cases, it's advantageous to do this random shuffling. There are certain classifiers which this is beneficial for. Naive Bayes isn't one of them. It's not affected by the order of the instances in the data set that it learns from. However, other classifiers like trees and rules can be. In a worst case, we might end up with a partition of our Spark RDD where certain class values aren't represented at all if the data has perhaps been collected in some systematic way. So for that reason, it can be beneficial to randomly shuffle the order of the instances before learning a classifier like a rule set or a decision tree. Before we finish today's lesson, let's take a look at one more of the example templates that come with distributed Weka. We'll take a look at the one that cross-validates two classifiers. So this runs an evaluation across validation inside of distributed Weka. So if we load this one, and I make it a little larger here, we can see that apart from the ARF header Spark job, and the randomly shuffled data spark job, we now can see two components called the Weka classifier evaluator, or evaluation, I should say, spark job. So these are job entries that will perform a cross validation out in Spark for us. There are two entries here, two Weka classifier evaluation spark job entries, because we're comparing two classifiers under cross validation. So we're comparing the naive base classifier again, and in this case, uh, the random forest classifier. So both of these will be evaluated under class validation inside of Spark. So let's run the flow and see what happens. Switch to the log, we can watch some activity. 
This will take a little bit longer than the previous job as we're running tenfold cross-validation. Let's take a look at the results in the text view here. Okay, we got two entries, one for naive base, which is this first one here, and the second one is for the random forest classifier. As we can see in the textual output, the results look exactly the same as if you were to run a cross-validation in desktop worker. And similarly for the random forest classifier. So let's consider how distributed Weka performs a cross-validation. It actually involves two separate phases or passes over the data. Phase one involves model construction and phase two involves model evaluation. So if we consider a, a simple threefold in the last lesson, we looked at how distributed Weka for Spark performs cross-validation. In this, the final lesson of this class, we'll touch briefly on a couple of knowledge flow templates that we haven't had time to look at so far. And we'll leave you with some things to look at for distributed Weka if you wish to take it further. Here we are back in the knowledge flow. If we open up the templates menu again, and scroll down a little bit here, we can see a template called Computer Correlation Matrix and Run PCA, where PCA stands for Principal Component Analysis. So let's open this one. I'll make it a little bit larger. All right, so what we have is our trusty ARF header Spark job, which loads our hypothyroid data again. And we have a little step here called the Correlation Matrix Spark job. And we have an image viewer and a text viewer attached to that. So that suggests that this job will produce uh, some kind of an image that we can take a look at and also some textual results. In the dialog for the correlation matrix Spark job here, we have a few options, mainly related to exactly what sort of matrix is going to be computed. So we can compute either a, a correlation matrix or a covariance matrix. And we have an option to run principal components analysis. So uh, the algorithm for principal components analysis can compute the principal components using either a correlation matrix as input or a covariance matrix. Right, let's run this now and see what it produces. takes a few seconds to run. And it's finished. Okay, let's open up the text viewer. So in the text viewer, we have the result of uh, the uh, principal components analysis and the correlation matrix that was computed. We can see that the correlation matrix and the principal component analysis only involve the numeric attributes that are present in the hypothyroid data. Let's take a quick look in the image viewer now. If we open up the image viewer, we can see that we have a graphical heat map representation of our correlation matrix, where the colors indicate the magnitude of the correlations between the attributes in all the numeric attributes in the hypothyroid data. All right, let's take a look at one more example before we finish with distributed Weka. So in the templates menu here, we have a job called run k-means parallel. So k-means parallel is, as the name suggests, a parallel version of the k-means algorithm. So for clustering in distributed Weka, unfortunately, we can't use the trick of creating a voted ensemble like we did with, in the classification case. It's not possible to make a voted ensemble out of separate clustering models. So this is why there is only k-means available in distributed Weka so far, as it's the only clustering algorithm that has been uh, implemented in a distributed fashion specifically for distributed Weka. This job takes a little while to run, 
So through the magic of video editing, I've executed it in between cuts to save a little bit of time. So it actually takes longer to run than sequential Weka does if you were to run k-means in the Explorer on the Hyperthyroid dataset. And this is simply due to the fact that there is a certain amount of overhead involved in Spark communication, the creation of its RDD data structures, and so forth. And that overhead actually outweighs the speed gained through uh, parallel processing in this local case when we're just using the cores that are available on our CPU. If our data set was much larger and we were running on a real cluster, then we would have a true benefit from using a distributed approach. In the text viewer, we can see the clustering results for k-means, which look exactly the same or are in the same format as if you were to run k-means in standalone Weka on your desktop. So where to from here? Experimenting with distributed Weka in local mode using small data sets is the best way to get familiar with the capabilities of it and to explore what it has to offer. However, if you want to process larger data sets, then you'll need to run on a cluster. So we'll take a little look at what's available out on the web to help you get started in that area. The first place to go for information is the main Apache Spark website. So let's take a look at that first. Okay, uh, under the documentation uh, section here, we can find the uh, documentation for the latest release of Spark. And if we go to that page, and there is information on downloading, running some examples, and then down here a little ways, we have information on launching on a cluster. So the first thing to look at is the overview of cluster mode. So this will describe exactly how a cluster is uh, configured and set up to run. And then there are uh, various different types of clusters that you can run Spark on. So the simplest is called a standalone mode. And there is a documentation section here on, on that mode. That would be the one to start with first. There are several other modes of uh, clustered running for Spark, uh, including something called Mesos and Yarn. So these are different ways of managing the machines in a cluster. But the standalone mode is the simplest. There are a number of blogs on the web that step you through the process of setting up a standalone cluster on a single machine. So if we search for Apache Spark standalone cluster install. And there are a number of hits in Google for uh, information on setting up a cluster. So one that's particularly concise, or at least I thought was concise and could be a good place to start, is this one here. So if we take a look at that, you can see a very short introduction to getting started with a Spark cluster running on a single machine. So this is different from what we've been looking at so far, where we've been running in local mode. That's where the entirety of Spark runs in a single JVM process. The uh, standalone cluster running on a single machine involves multiple separate Java processes, and they communicate as if they were running on, on different machines. So this tutorial is a reasonably short introduction to getting started with that. Well, that's it for this lesson. Today we took a look at how you can use distributed Weka to compute a correlation matrix in Spark, and then use that correlation matrix as input to a principal component analysis. We also took a look at the k-means algorithm running in a distributed fashion inside of Spark. And we took a little look at information on setting up Spark clusters. Well, I hope you've enjoyed learning about how to use Weka in a distributed processing environment. And now I'll leave you with some links to further information on distributed Weka and on Apache Spark.
Hi, my name is Mike Mayo and today I'm just going to demonstrate for you the Image Filters package which is a, a package you can download for Weka using the uh, Package Manager. And what the Image Filters package does is let you uh, convert images into features so that you can run image classification experiments. And then you can do exciting things like uh, face recognition, scene recognition, and maybe even uh, object detection. So what, what I'll do is just go over um, what the image filters package does in this lesson and give a quick demo. So what is an image feature? Basically it's a measurement concerning an image. So in this example there's a couple of uh, images. One is a sunflower, one is a tree, and uh, the measurements that we're taking from the image are to do with things like such as color and brightness and shape. So both of those images uh, vary quite a bit in terms of uh, those four different measurements. And once we calculate those measurements we can put them together into a feature vector and then we can use Weka's standard machine learning algorithms to do some uh, image experiments and see if we can classify different types of images. So the first thing you need to do when you want to run an image classification experiment is get a whole lot of images. For the image filters to work they all need to be in one directory. So here I've got um, an example of a data set. It's basically a, a collection of monarch butterfly images and uh, owl images and we can see that they're pretty easy to distinguish. Uh, monarch butterflies are mostly orange and black, um, owls are mostly white. So once you have your directory of images you need to create an ARF file and the R file is um, just like the normal R files you've been using so far. Uh, the only difference is that it only contains two attributes. And, and welcome to my class on scripting. How would you do scripting? Well, there's pros and cons to scripting. Positive side of things. When you write a script, it basically captures all the steps that you perform from pre-processing over modeling to evaluation. Also, when you write a script, you really only write it once and you can run it multiple times with no extra cost. It's also very easy to create a variant of a script in order to test some theories. For example, tweaking some parameters of a classifier or swapping out a classifier completely. And the best thing about scripting is you don't need to compile anything like you would have to with Java code. On the not so good side of things, you will have to do programming. You need to familiarize yourself with the APIs of the libraries that are involved and writing code is usually slower than clicking in the GUI. Now what scripting languages will we cover in this class? We will cover Jython, Python and Groovy. Jython is basically a pure Java implementation of Python 2.7 which runs solely in a Java virtual machine. This means it gives you access to all the Java libraries that are in the class path. If you're using Python code, then it has to be pure Python. No native libraries like, for example, NumPy would use. As in Python, we'll be using Python 2.7 and we'll be invoking Weka through Python 2.7. It gives you then all the access that you need to the full Python library ecosystem. At the end, we'll be touching briefly on Groovy which is a Java-like syntax and also runs in the Java virtual machine. And once again, it gives you access to all the Java libraries on the class path. In order to demonstrate why Python might be a good choice of programming language for doing the scripting, is simply by comparing what Java code would look like and Python code would like for doing the same thing. So what we're trying to do is simply outputting 10 times Hello Weka MOOC. So looking at the Java code here is you have the outer class definition, then you have your main method. Inside the main method you have your for loop where you finally output stuff. In Python, this whole thing collapsed to a two-liner. You simply iterate from 0 to 9 and then print the whole thing out. Done. Now in order to have Jython support in Weka, we need to install a package. So I'm going to start up Weka and the package manager. I'm presuming that you're already familiar with the package manager. And we need to install Tiger Jython 1.0.0, not the latest version. Gave me a bit of grief lately. Um, 
So we scroll down to Tiger Jython. And if you want to install a specific version, if you can simply open up in the repository version tab column, and you can sort of like get a drop down box and select simply 100 instead of 101. I've already done that. And um, for plotting light on in lesson three, we also want to use JFree chart. And for that reason, you want to install the JFree chart off screen renderer library, not version 102 is fine. After we've done that, we have to restart basically Weka. And then under the tools menu, we will have a Jython console menu item, which brings up a little user interface for writing and running Jython scripts. The first time around, it takes a little bit longer because it analyzes all the libraries that are basically in your class path. Okay, here's our little interface. So what you can see here is, um, here's basically where you write your script. Um, down here you would see errors and so on, an output that your script generates, and you execute your script with the green triangle up here. You can also turn debug mode on and off, uh, which allows you basically to step through the program that you've written. You can also set book, uh, breakpoints up here, which allow you to stop at certain points in the program and then analyze, for instance, what the values for variables are and so on. When running things, I usually run multiple scripts in parallel. So under preferences, I usually have a small font and I'd rather use tabs than just a single one. So let's just revisit our really, really simple example that we had previously, where we were just outputting our hello world, more or less. Okay, so when we run this, not in debug mode for the time being, I'm just gonna run that. We'll see there's an output from one to 10, hello Wekamook. Now, if we are in debug mode, once again, toggling it, then we can define how fast it actually goes through and we can simply go through and run it. And you can see the instruction pointer is sort of like toggling between those two lines. And you can also see over here when you open up variables and types that the variable i gets incremented. So this is sort of like the first quick introduction to the Tiger Jython interface. When you're writing code, you have to find, of course, information. And the best information on Java libraries like Weka is using a Java doc. So you can have either the online documentation on the SourceForge homepage, which is always the latest one, or if you're not working with the latest version, then you can simply go into the doc directory in your Java in your Weka installation and use that. Also, coming with your release or snapshot that you've installed, you will find a Weka examples.zip file which contains quite a lot of example code that should get you going in how to use APIs and whatnot of Weka. And last but not least, also check out the Weka manual PDF document, which in the appendix under the using the API section, you will find most of the important APIs in Weka explained and how to use them. Of course, I promised that we're gonna write a little script. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna load data and filter it and print it out. However, since all the installations of Weka will be different around the world, in order to find data sets, I'll be using a little trick. I'll be using an environment variable to point to the directory where I've stored my data sets. So I'm going to close Weka for the time being. And you can see here on my desktop in the data directory, I have various data sets you'll be downloading throughout the class and we want to point to that directory and I'm going to basically for this purpose I'm going to copy that path and I'm going to add an environment variable so I'm going to go into the advanced settings environment variables and I'm going to create one called MOOC Let's go data and paste that in there. Okay, okay, and okay. Close that dialog again. And we can close that too. And then we can start up Wicca again. Now we're starting up our Jython console again. One 
instances there. So first of all, we will have to import some classes to actually do stuff. So first of all, we actually want to load data and we'll be using the data source class for that, abbreviated to DS, the filter for filtering a data set and the remove filter to do the actual work. The OS library is a Jason slash Python library, which gives us access to the operating system, like for example, environment variables and so on. So in order to utilize the MOOC data environment variables that I've just configured, I'm using the OS environment get method, um, the OS separator method, forward or backward slash, depending on what operating system you're running, plus the name of the data set, in this case, Iris. So I'm basically loading that. Then we're gonna configure our filter. So we want to have a remove filter. We want to remove the last attribute, which is done via the minus R last options. Then we are telling the filter about what the data actually looks like so it can configure itself internally. And then we're using the filter class to actually push through the data through our remove filter and get a new data set. And finally, we're going to output that new data set. Hello again. Glad to see you're back for some more scripting with Weka. What we're going to cover in this lesson is building models and evaluating them. So the classes that we're going to touch upon in this lesson are Weka classifiers evaluation for evaluating classifiers, um, some classifiers, filters we've already seen in the last lesson, and some randomization stuff where we're going to use some Java SDK classes. So the first thing that we want to do is building AJ48 classes fire. So I'm going to start up our Jython console again. And for this script, we will basically load some data, configure a J48 classifier, build it and output the model. So first of all, the imports. Once again, our data source for loading data and our J48 classifier. Once again, we are going to load our data using our environment variable. This time we're loading the anneal UCI data set. And since it's classification, we also have to set the class attribute. In this case, it's the last one. So with num attributes, you can determine the number of attributes in a data set. And with set class index, you can set which of these attributes is going to be the class attribute. However, since it's an API, usually starts counting at zero and not as one. So that's why we have num attributes minus one. Next thing is, we're going to instantiate our J48 classifier and we're going to set some options. In this case, we're changing the confidence factor from the default value of 0.25 to 0.3. With the data available now and the classifier configured, we can build it, which simply happens with a build classifier call supplying the data. And then as a final step, we are outputting the model with a simple print statement. When we run that, we can see the model that is being output after build on the data. Now that wasn't very hard. As a next step, we want to evaluate a model that we've built. And in this case, we're going to use cross validation because there's no point in building a model if you don't actually know whether it's any good. So we're going to open a new tab and then import some more stuff again. In this case, we also need the evaluation class. And since we are cross validation, we also want to randomize the data. In that case, we're importing the random class. Okay, just like before, we're loading the anneal UCI data set, setting the class attribute. Then we're configuring the same classifier again, confidence factor once again 0.3. And then we're sort of like setting up our evaluation. So first of all, we are initializing our evaluation class with the current data in order to obtain the class priors. And then we're calling the cross-validate model method of the evaluation class with the classifier template not built um, the data that we want to evaluate on 
the number of folds, in our case we're doing tenfold cross validation, and the random number generator to initialize with a seed value of 1. After that finishes, we will have basically all the statistics inside the evaluation object and we want to output some things. First thing is going to be we want to output some summary statistics. There's the so-called two summary string method. If you look at the Java doc, you will realize there's actually several methods. Um, one with no attribute, one with a boolean attribute, and one with string and boolean attribute, like we are using here. Now, the difference between Python and Java is that Python doesn't have polymorphism. It has optional parameters and named parameters. So, in order for Jython to work, you basically have one method that has all the various parameters then available. And in this case, we have to provide a title for basically our summary string and that we don't want to output any complexity statistics, hence false. That is that. And since it's classification, we also want to output the confusion matrix, which you can do with the to matrix string. So when we're running the script now, we will see in the output now our usual summary statistics of accuracy, what's missed, um, kappa statistic, all kinds of errors, um, coverage, and how many instances there were all together in the data set, almost 900 in the annual data set case. And the confusion matrix that was also output, and you can see there's hardly any instances that are not on the diagonal. According to our misclassified ones, should be only 14. So we have three here, two there, two there, and seven there, which is 14. So all is good. The final script that we want to do in this lesson is how we can actually use a build model to make predictions. So I'm going to open a new tab again. And in this case, like in the first script, we are importing our data source for loading data and our J48 classifier. We are once again loading a data set. In this case, we're not using the usual anneal data set, but one that's been stripped down a bit. Um, it's the anneal train set, but still class attribute in the same location, so it's the last one setting that. We are once again configuring our J48 classifier because we were happy with that configuration. Based on our cross validation results, it results in excellent results. Then we are building our classifier on the data, once again using the build classifier method. And since we want to make predictions on unlabeled data, we are now loading the unlabeled data in. So in this case, data set anneal unlabeled, which basically has the same data set structure but just missing values for the class and we also set the class attribute for this one it is usually recommended that you compare your training and test slash unlabeled data whether they are actually compatible and you can use a method of the instances class called equal headers message which for telling whether two data sets are the same if you look at this code here the unlabeled data is checked against the training data and this will return a message, but only in the case if they are different. For instance, not different number of attributes, different types or different order of labels, then it will output a message. Otherwise, it will just output none on the Java case, no. So in case we have a discrepancy between our data sets, then this will be output. Simply saying that they are not the same. And for making our predictions finally, since we now have our unlabeled data and our build model, we basically just iterate through our unlabeled data row by row, and then we obtain our class distribution by calling the distribution by instance method. We want to know what the chosen class label is, so we're using the classifier instance method, which returns us in case of nominal at class attribute, the label index starting with zero. And in order to determine what the string label actually is, we use the data set, retrieve the class attribute, and then determine the string value 
that is associated with that particular index. And to actually output anything, we are then outputting with a simple print statement our class distribution, our label index, and the associated label. And running that, you get an output like this. First you get an array, which is the class distribution, then the index of the label, and the label itself, all separated by hyphens. And at the bottom, you can see you have one, two, three, four, five, six labels all together in there, so index five, and the label is U in this case. So, what we've learned in this lesson is how to build a classifier. We can output statistics from cross-validation that we've obtained from a classifier on a particular data set. And we also used a built model to actually make predictions on new unlabeled data. That are some great visualization stuff. So, like I've mentioned in the first lesson, we'll be using Jeffrey chart for some of the plotting because Wacker's plotting is a little bit complicated and it's much, much nicer doing Jeffrey chart plots. So if you haven't done already, please install the Jeffrey chart of screen renderer package, which I already mentioned earlier. And if you're looking for more Java doc on the Jfree chart library, you can do that on the jfree.org website. The classes that we'll be touching on for Jfree chart will be basically data sets that Jfree chart needs for plotting, um, chart factory for creating plots, and the chart panel, which is actually used for embedding plots then in the GUI. And finally, some Weka classes for displaying trees and graphs. First of all, I'm going to start up Weka and the Jython console. And for the first script, we'll want to plot the classifier errors in a obtained from a linear regression regressor on a data set and plot these. But not just actual versus predicted, but also take into account how bad the error is. So, first thing. We're going to import a whole bunch of classes again. So evaluation for evaluating our classifier. We're going to use linear regression as a simple classifier for doing the regression. Data source for the usual loading of the data set. Default XYZ data set is a JFree chart data set which allows you to store three dimensions for each data point. We're basically using the Z as the error. The chart factory for generating the plot, chart panel for embedding it, and the bubble renderer basically plots a bubble at the XY position using the Z value as the radius. Okay, so we're loading our data. In this case, it's a numeric class in the body fat UCI data set. Then we are configuring our linear regression classifier, turning off some bits we don't need. and also, also makes it a bit faster. Once again, we are cross-validating our classifier with tenfold cross-validation. And after the cross-validation is done, we need to collect basically the predictions and need to compute the error. So what we're going to do here is quite simple. We're going to start with three empty lists, the actual, the predicted, and the error. And we're going to loop through all of the predictions which we can retrieve via the predictions method and retrieve those predictions, store the actual and predicted and calculate the error, which is basically actual minus predicted and the absolute value of that. Having done that, we can then create our data set, which is a default XYZ data set. We are adding a series to this data set, which we simply give it a name like linear regression on the name of the relation uh, of the data set with the actual predicted and error and then we're using our chart factory to create a plot and in that case a scatter plot <clears throat> and 
with a title, actual and predicted as the access titles. And as a renderer, since we not only want to plot a little dot at that location, X and Y, we use a specific renderer, the one that I mentioned earlier, XY bubble renderer. And then we are simply embedding the whole thing in a frame and displaying that. Let's run that. And here we go. As we can see, some of the outliers are quite large and the ones that are closest to the diagonal, the optimal case, are the smallest ones. And we can even zoom in if we wanted to and it gets adjusted accordingly. The next script handles ROC curves for classification because the area under the curve and how the curves for the various class labels are is actually telling you quite an important story about how well your classifier is doing. So in this case, once again, new tab, we're going to import a whole lot of classes again. In this case, we're evaluating naive base and um, we're using a threshold curve class from Weka, which allows us to calculate the ROC curve data, among other things. Since we're only plotting x, y in this case, um, we don't need an x, y, z data set, just an x, y one will do. And once again, chart factory and so on, which we've already seen in the other one. Now, once again, we load data set. <clears throat> in this case, we are loading the balance scale UCI data set, which has a nominal class, setting the class attribute to the last one again instantiating our naive base classifier, no options to be set, and cross-validating that once again with tenfold cross-validation to obtain the uh, statistics. We are creating our data set again, and since we want to plot the ROC curves for all the class labels, we're going to have to loop through all the labels, of course. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have a variable which is going to ranging from zero to the number of values minus one that the class attribute has. Okay, in each case, we're going to create the threshold curve data. So we instantiate a threshold curve and then use the predictions of the evaluation class and the current index of the label that we're interested in and create curve data from that. And we can simply extract then those columns of data from the data set curve that was generated and put that into a list. So we're looking basically at the false positive right versus the true positive right that we want to plot. And then, since we are already have a data set, we are adding a plot series basically to it. And to make it a bit more interesting, we are also calculating basically the ROC curve for each of the class labels. And use that as the label for the plot. Okay. Now we are creating an XY line plot because we're connecting the dots rather than just dotting them around like it was with the bubble plot earlier. Um, put the titles for the axes down, false positive right and true positive right. And then once again put that in a frame and display it. Let's run that. And we have our three class labels, L, B and R. And as you can see, the blue line is the worst one. And if you look it up, it also has an AUC of only 0.719, whereas the other ones have almost one. As you can see, they go straight up and then really nestled quite nicely in the corner here and then plateauing out at pretty much one up there. So that looks pretty sweet. So this was basically using JFreeChart to plot some um, graphs.
However, we can also plot some data using um, simple Wecker classes. So in this case, we want to plot a tree that got generated by a J4DA. So once again, we import stuff. And as visualization, we're going to use the tree visualizer. And first of all, once again, we have to import some, load some data in. In this case, the RS data set. We're going to build an unpro J48 tree. Um, build it on the data set. And then we are creating a tree visualizer using the graph that the build classifier returns and then we're embedding the whole thing in a frame visualizing that and once the frame has been displayed we can also fit the tree then basically to the size that's on the screen running that basically have a nice little tree of the iris data set now trees aren't the only thing that we can plot um, the base net classifier allows you to plot network graph. So far, we've been using Python from within the Java Virtual Machine. However, in this lesson, we're going to invoke Weka from within Python. But you might ask, why the other way? Isn't it enough using Jython? Well, yes and no. Jython limits you basically to pure Python code and to Java libraries. And Weka provides only modeling and some limited visualizations. However, Python has so much more to offer. For example, NumPy, a library for efficient arrays and matrices, SciPy for linear algebra, optimization and integration. There's Matplotlib, a great plotting library. You can check all this out on the Python wiki under the American Scientific Libraries. So, what do we need? Well, first of all, we have to install Python 2.7, which you can download from python.org. Um, but make sure that Java that you've got installed in your machine and Python have the same bitness. So they're either 32-bit or 64-bit. You cannot mix things. And you have to set up an environment that you can actually compile some libraries. On Linux, that's an absolute no-brainer. A few lines on the command line and you're done within five minutes. However, OS X and Windows are quite a bit of work involved, so it's not necessarily for the faint-hearted. So you can install the Python Weka repo library, which we're going to use in today's lesson, and you find that uh, in some instructions on how to install for the various platforms on that page. So good luck with that, and I've got it already installed. So I'm going to talk a bit about more what the Python Weka wrapper actually is. So this library fires up a Java virtual machine in the background and communicates via the, with the JVM via Java native interface. It uses the Java bridge library for doing that. And the Python Weka wrapper library sits on top of that and provides a thin wrapper around basically Weka superclasses like classifiers, filters, clusters, and so on. And in difference to the Jython code that I've seen so far, it provides a lot more a Pythonic API. Here's some examples. Python properties are, for example, used instead of the Java get set method pairs. For example, options instead of get options set options. It uses lowercase plus underscore instead of Java's camel case. So cross validate underscore model instead of cross, capital V, validate, capital M model. It also has some convenience methods that Weka doesn't have. For example, data dot classes last instead of data set class index data dot number attributes minus one. And plotting is done via matplotlib. Right. So, I presume you were lucky installing everything and you sorted everything out. And I've already done that on my machine here because it takes way too long. And I'm going to fire up the interactive Python interpreter. And for the first script, we basically want to revisit cross validating a J48 classifier. So, as with all the other examples, we had to import some libraries, of course. So. 
In this case, we are communicating with the JVM, so we have to have some form of communicating with it and starting and stopping it. So we import the Weka Core JVM library module and um, we want to load data. So we're going to import the converters and we're importing evaluation and classifier. First of all, we're going to start the JVM. In this case, the, in using the packages as well is not strictly necessary, but we'll just do it. You can see a lot of output here. It basically tells you what the libraries are in the class path, which is all good. Next thing is we're going to load some data. In this case, our anneal data set. Once again, using the same approach that we've already done with Jython, using the environment variable. That's loaded. Then we're going to set the class, which is the last one. And we're going to configure our J48 classifier. So whereas in Jython, we simply said, oh, I want to have the J48 class. Here we're basically going to instantiate a classifier class here and tell basically that class what Java class to use, which is our J48 classifier, and with what options. So the same confidence factor of point three. <clears throat> and once again, same thing for the evaluation class. We instantiate an evaluation object with the training data as to determine the priors and then cross-validate the classifier on the data with tenfold cross-validation. That is done. And now we can also output our evaluation summary. Done. And this is sort of like simply with evaluation.summary, the title, and we don't want to have any um, complexity statistics being output. And since in our Jive example, we also had the confusion matrix, we're going to output that as well. And here's our confusion matrix. And one thing you should never forget is once you're done, you also have to stop the JVM and shut it down properly. So we can see once again, like with the other one, we have 14 misclassified examples out of our almost 900 examples. And you can count those three, two, two and seven, 14 here in the confusion matrix as well. For the next script, we'll be plotting the classifier errors obtained from a linear regression classifier on a numeric data set. And once again, we'll be using the errors between predicted and actual as the size of the bubbles that we're going to do. Once again, I'm going to fire up the interactive Python interpreter. I'm going to import as usual, a bunch of modules. Um, in this case, new is the plotting module for classifiers. I'm going to import here. And we'll start up our JVM. We are loading our body fat data set in, setting the class attribute. Then we're going to configure our linear regression. Once again, turning off some bits that make it faster. And we're going to evaluate it on our data set with tenfold cross validation. Done. And now we can plot it with a single line. Of course, we're cheating here a little bit because the module does a lot of the heavy lifting, which we had to do with Jive manually. And here we go. Nice plot. So, of course, you can also zoom in if you wanted to. Right. And the final step, stop the JVM again and we can exit. The last script that we're going to do in this lesson will be plotting multiple ROC curves like we've done with Jython. Once again, the Python interpreter. That's a nice thing. You can just open it up and do stuff straight away. Import stuff. Once again, we're using the plotting module for classifiers. We are starting up the JVM. 
so I can get good at that. Loading the balance scale data set like we did with Jython. And we also use the naive base classifier. As you can see, this time there's no options. Cross validate the whole thing, 10 for cross validation. And then we use the plot RC method to plot everything. And we want to plot 0, 1, and 2 class label indices. And here we have those. Once again, we can see the AUC values for each of the labels, whether it's L, B, or R. And final step, stopping the JVM again and exiting. Okay, so in this lesson, we actually you installed Python and additional modules via Python's pip command. And we used Weka from within a native Python environment using the Python Weka wrapper library. Again, and welcome to the last lesson on scripting. This lesson is slightly different than the other ones because we'll be looking at a real world challenge. And then as a second part, we'll be looking at another scripting language called Groove. First to the challenge. The challenge is basically from an annual shootout of the Council for Near Infrared Spectroscopy. And the shootout process basically works as follows. You basically build your data on the training data, which is called calibration in near infrared spectroscopy terms. You evaluate your model on the separate data set, which is the test data set. And then you basically generate and submit predictions in the shootout process. However, we don't do the last step of submitting any predictions because that particular challenge has already finished. But we're still going to use the data that's publicly available at the link below that you can download and then run. What are you going to do? Well, first you're going to download the CSV files for dataset 1 and 2. Just going to go on the website here. So here's dataset 1 and 2. And for each one of them, you download the CSV files. And you only need the calibration and the test set. We don't need the validation one. And then you generate basically data for Weka in R format for building the model calibration and then for evaluating the model the test set the class attribute in the calibration data set is called reference value and you shouldn't include the sample number in your model this is basically now up to you to come up not only with the proper data set and that they're compatible training and test set but you should also then try and come up with a good regression scheme for predicting the reference values. But what do you have to beat? Well, in our case, you have to beat on dataset one, a correlation coefficient of 0.8644 and a root mean square error of 0.384. And on dataset two, you have to beat a correlation coefficient of 0.9986 and a root mean squared error of 0 0.0026. Up for the challenge? Good luck. Now to the second part of using Groovy, another scripting language. As I already mentioned in the introduction, Groovy also runs in the JVM and can be installed through the package manager as well. If you haven't done so already, please open up the package manager and um, install the KF Groovy package. Doesn't matter what version. Uh, KF for knowledge flow Groovy. I've already done that and i'm going to show you basically what the interface looks like so once again just like with the jython console you'll find a groovy console menu item under the tools menu in the gui chooser and once you've opened up that you'll find the appearance of the groovy console very much similar to that of the jython console like on the top you basically write your script and at the bottom you'll see the output however in the Groovy console, you cannot use multiple tabs. You would have to sort of like open multiple instances. But for our purposes, that's sufficient. Now, before we're going to start, um, just a few minor Groovy basics. So the grammar of Groovy is derived from Java, but with the exceptions, you don't have to write any semicolons to finish a line, which makes it much nicer. Um, def for definition basically defines a variable. You don't have to require um, any types or anything. Lists are very similar to the Python ones, 
um, square brackets and just comma separated can be mixed types maps are also very similar to the python ones um, what they're called dictionaries in python however you don't use curly brackets you still use um, square brackets and groovy also enhances the java syntax for example you have multi-line strings by using triple single quotes you can use string interpolation you can also have default imports of commonly used packages like java lung java io java.net and so on and last but not least closures they are not quite the same as java 8 lambdas um, but they are a very powerful tool they're basically anonymous code blocks which can take parameters and return values as well and can be assigned to variables if you want to look at some differences between java and groovy then follow the link one really funky thing about groovy that i very much like is looping of course you will have the standard java for loop and while loop but you can also use since everything is an object in groovy you can also use some additional methods called up to times and step as long as you have number objects like integers and so on so if you look at up to if you have 0 dot up to 10 that basically outputs all the numbers from 0 to 10 both included if you do times for example five dot times that basically outputs the numbers from 0 to 5 with 5 excluded so it outputs the numbers 0 1 2 3 4 and last but not least you can also step through so if you have 0 dot step 10 comma 2 that means you're going from 0 to 10 at a step 2 so it outputs basically the numbers 0 2 4 6 and 8 okay so with the basics out of the way we're going to dive into writing one of the scripts that we've already seen previously in Jython and Python Maker Wrapper, and we're going to make some predictions with a build classifier. So once again, as always, we're going to have some imports, and just similar to Jython, we're just going to import the whole classes. Um, we once again do the trick with our environment variable. However, here we use system.get environment. Then we're loading our training data so once again using the mooc underscore data environment variable using our shortcut variable and loading the anil train data set setting the class attribute as once again as the last one and we're also loading in the unlabeled data and setting the class as well now we're going to instantiate a j48 we're going to set some options as a minor difference here to um, Jython, you actually have to specify that this is a string array. So even though you have a list of strings, um, you just have to say what you actually want to cast it to. And once again, build our classifier on the training data and I'll put the build model just for the fun of it. Now we want to once again look at um, making predictions first of all we're gonna sort of like look at what um, labels we have and in this case we're gonna use this previously mentioned dot times that allows us for the number of values that the class attribute has from 0 to times minus 1 um, and we are basically adding the string label to it which we can then also output with a simple print line statement and we are using the lists join method and we're joining basically all those elements in the list with a comma basically generating a comma separated string and once again using our um, times method by this time we'll be using the number of instances in the data set so for all the rows in the data We'll be basically calling the classifiers distribution for instance in order to retrieve the class distribution and then simply output what the class distribution is okay and when we're running this thing you will first see that it actually loads the whole thing into the jvm here on top it just outputs this is what we're loading and then after that you can see our j48 tree that we built on the training data and then we can have here our class labels 
and finally the class distributions for all the rows in the data. Slightly different to Jython and Python Wicker Wrapper, but not too different. As the second script, we'll be looking at outputting multiple RC curves on the balance scale data again. Start from scratch. So once again, we have a bunch of imports that we need. Um, this case, the evaluation class again. We're going to use naive base as the classifier again. Um, the threshold curve, um, which allows us to compute basically the RC curves and so on. Um, data source for loading the data. And once again, we're going to use J3 chart for the plotting. Okay, first thing we're going to load the data in again using our environment variable. Sending class review as the last one. We're going to instantiate our naive base. Once again, there's no options necessary. Then we're going to cross validate it after initializing the evaluation object on the training data. We're going to do tenfold cross validation and once again using a seed value of one for a random number generator. Having that done, we can now then create our plot data set once again. It's just a simple XY data set again. And as you can see, we're going to use our dot times again. So basically for all, since we want to do multiple, uh, all the labels in the class, um, we can once again use the number of labels that we have in the class view dot times and use the iterator once again to retrieve the curve data, then retrieve um, the data from the false positive right column and the true positive right column, turn that basically into lists. And we're adding that then as a data series to our plot data set, including the ROC, the AUC area. Having done that, we can then create the plot, which is just an XY line chart, a simple one, and um, with axes of false positive right and true positive right. And as the last step as usual, we're gonna create a frame, embed a chart panel with the plot and make the whole thing visible. Okay, and when we run that, it takes a little while, and then we basically have our plot that we've already seen before. You've now basically seen quite a range of scripting languages they can use on the Weka API, whether it is within the JVM or outside using Python itself. And last but not least, you also had some fun with a real world data challenge and I hope you were but much, much better than I was. Okay, that's it for scripting. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you sometime. Bye bye. Hi, it's me, back again. I've probably got a bit of a tan since I saw you last. I've been out sailing around the coast of New Zealand in my beautiful yacht, Beulah. Here she is for a couple of weeks while the other guys have been recording the lessons. Anyway, I'm just back here to close out the course. Uh, we've done a lot in this course. Uh, this is just a course summary. Um, we've covered a lot of ground and uh, you've learned a lot. And uh, congratulations for getting this far and double congratulations if you've managed to do all of the activities. At the end of the last course, more data mining with Weka. This is a slide actually from the last uh, lesson of the last course. I looked at what we'd missed in that course and I proposed that we might do a third course advanced data mining with Weka. Well, this is what we've done in advanced data mining with Weka. We've done most of the things that uh, I proposed at the end of the last course. A couple of things have been missed out, multi-instance learning and uh, latent semantic analysis. You'll have to learn those yourself, I'm afraid. Uh, we didn't do a lesson on one class classification, but there was a good activity on that, activity 3.1. And we've done some extra things. We've done some scripting in the Python and Groovy language, and we've done some applications. And of course, we've done the Weka package system. So we've done pretty well what we promised to do, or what we suggested we might do last time, and a bit more besides. I hope you've enjoyed it. The applications we've looked at have been particularly enlightening, I think. So the first one was Jeff Holmes talked about infrared data from soil samples. And he explained that it was hard to achieve sufficiently good performance for practical application in the activity. You didn't get there. You need to do more work on those data sets. You need to investigate uh, 
dealing with outliers and uh, improving the quality of the data and some more uh, tweaking of the classifiers and filters in that huge space of experimentation. Then uh, uh, Tony, Tony Smith talked about bioinformatics, the problem of signal peptide prediction. And uh, he emphasized that its domain knowledge is vital. You need to collaborate with experts. And that's true, of course, for all applications. And uh, you need to know whether you're looking for an accurate prediction or an explanatory model. And overfitting, of course, is a big issue in all applications. Uh, then Pamela talked about uh, functional MRI neuroimaging data. You know, what's going on in your brain? It was a 3D, a 4D data set, the three dimensions of your head plus an extra dimension of time. Uh, and uh, again, the performance uh, we got in the activity was uh, not all that high, and there were various things that we might consider doing to improve that, uh, most of which uh, would involve uh, domain experts to help interpret the data. This is a common thread through all the applications. And a very interesting finding was, uh, in an early competition, uh, just the demographic data alone did well. In fact, it won the competition. So it's very important to evaluate what you're doing and uh, try the simple models first. We've been saying that all along. And finally, we looked at image. Mike told us about image classification and the specialist uh, feature extraction techniques for, uh, for images. Uh, in fact, when I asked him to do this lesson, we didn't have the feature extraction package that we now have in Weka. He created it in order to do the lesson. And this is typical in, uh, in applications. You need uh, different extraction techniques or different kinds of data. I'm interested in enabling you to carry on learning, to keep learning in the future. And the one really good way is to look at data mining competitions. There's a website called Kaggle. Let me just find it for you. Just do a Google search for Kaggle. And here we have it, uh, Kaggle competitions. There's a large number of competitions here. The first group, this group here, these are the featured competitions, and here you can win money. This uh, AI science challenge is worth 80, worth 80 grand, for example, and the Home Depot product search relevance for 40 grand. You can win real money doing data mining with these competitions. The second group of competitions are for recruitment purposes. You can get jobs. If you do well with the Airbnb challenge or the Telstra challenge or the Yelp challenge, they'll offer you a job in data mining. So that's pretty cool. Uh, here are some featured data sets. Actually, the IRIS data set uh, you're very familiar with from the first courses. Uh, but here are some interesting ones, the ocean ship logbooks and uh, salaries in the San Francisco area. And some data sets we're playing around. Here's the San Francisco crime classification data set. Sounds very interesting. And these last, this last group is kind of getting started, sort of tutorial educational competitions uh, where you can play around with these and look at what other people have done. These are all current competitions. You can find the past competitions by looking for completed competitions. That's the phrase. Let's just look for those. And uh, here we've got competitions from two years ago. Half a million two years ago. Sorry, you're too late for that. Uh, but anyway, uh, someone won half a million uh, two years ago, and here's a big money in competitions. Here's a quarter of a million, again, a couple of years old. So there's just a lot of uh, past competitions. On the Kaggle website, we have not just those competitions, but information about completed competitions, past solutions, the interviews with, uh, with winners on the Kaggle blog, and descriptions of winner solutions. So there's a lot of information there. If you want to keep learning about data mining, then Kaggle would be a good place to start. I just have to finish with a little word on ethics. Don't forget, I'm always saying this. Here's the ethics of data mining is uh, very much in the news these days. It's just a few web quotes I got with a very quick search. More than ever, knowingly or unknowingly, consumers disseminate personal data in daily activities. Well, we all know that. As companies seek to capture data about consumer habits, privacy concerns have flared. Yes. Data mining where legality and ethics rarely meet. That's an interesting uh, little title. And the point of that article was that uh, just because you're doing things legally in accordance with the law doesn't necessarily mean you're doing things ethically. I would like you to do things ethically because you're an ethical person. It's the right thing to do. You have personal integrity. But if that's not enough for you, there are good business reasons for doing things ethically. 
Big data might be big business, but overzealous data mining can seriously destroy your brand. You have to be very careful when you're doing data mining. And the uh, final one, what big data needs, a code of ethical practices. So please be aware of ethical issues when you do your data mining. Well, that's it. This is the end of the course. Uh, I hope to meet you again in some other place, some other time. I look forward to that. Um, meanwhile, enjoy your data mining. Good luck with the uh, assessment that you're about to do to get your statement of completion. And while you're doing that, I'll go back to doing something I really love and play some music. Bye for now.